actually quite old. Uh, people have been interested in how brains work um, at the level of its deep structure for over a hundred years. It's been clear that the brain is made up of nerve cells that are connected together in, in very complicated patterns. Uh, but uh, the approach of trying to figure out exactly how all the brain cells are connected to each other, a kind of mapping of the entire brains, have, has been really impossible until relatively recently. And now uh, it seems conceivable, at least, that one can get an, a sense of how brains are organized at this deep level by mapping out all the connections between nerve cells. And this is an omics, like genomics is the omics of all the genes that make up the instruction book uh, to make cells and organisms. Uh, the omics of the connections of the brain would be the mapping of all those wires, and that would be connectomics. I think it's been known probably since the invention of microscopes uh, that every organ in the body has uh, unique cell types and these cells are uh, put together in these motifs that underlie the function of the organs. So for example, in a kidney uh, there are a bunch of cells that form these tubules called the nephron and the nephron has a filtering function for the blood to remove toxic waste and other ingredients that come out as urine. And it has taken some time, but thanks to microscopes, it's become pretty clear what cell types make up a nephron and how a nephron works. And frankly, if you understand how a single nephron works, you understand a kidney, despite the fact that a kidney is made up of hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of nephrons, because each one is like every other one. So once you understand one nephron, you understand the whole kidney. In fact, the whole kidney is just, because it is iterating the same structure over and over again, there's nothing very special about one kidney as opposed to the other kidney. For example, you can give your kidney away, one of your kidneys away, and the other kidney will do pretty well for you. And the same is true for liver. Uh, part of your liver does the same thing as another part. There's a little motif known as the portal triad. Once you understand that, basically, it's just that same uh, motif and that same function iterated over and over again, and the same for a lung. The brain, however, is very different, uh, because I, although I could lose a lung and survive, I could lose half my liver, if I take out half of your brain or anyone's brain, you'll notice a difference immediately, and that's because brains are made up of uh, a much more diverse set of cellular organizations. The front of your brain, the frontal cortex, for example, does completely different things than the back of the brain, the occipital cortex. The spinal cord has a completely different role in your body than the cerebral cortex, and the cerebellum has a different role, and a place called the amygdala has a different role. Every single part of the brain has its own unique function, and surprisingly, its own unique cell types and those cells are wired together in unique ways everywhere. So you can't simply understand the whole brain by understanding one little piece. You actually have to understand every little piece, and every little piece is different from every other little piece. There's no other aspect of our body that's like that. There's just nothing like it anywhere else. And this has been a tremendous problem uh, for understanding brains. Not only how the normal brains work, but how brains work poorly in cases of brain disease. And I mention this because for most organ systems, most diseases can be traced back to an abnormality in the biochemistry or the structure of the cells that make up some part of the motif. So for most kidney diseases, most lung diseases, most liver diseases, you can trace it back. And the field of pathology is the field where people look at these abnormal organs and see something wrong. The field of neuropathology is, is very useful for things like tumors of the brain. But the neuropathology of schizophrenia which is 1% of the population, or autism, just a tremendous number of children with this disorder, or the wide range of other psychiatric or behavioral disorders, there is no pathology. And so some people think the brains must be normal at the level of the cells. 
That's not the case. The case is actually we just don't know because no one has ever really looked at enough detail to see what the physical structure of the brain is at those high levels because it just seems an insurmountable amount of complexity. And for many years it has been. But now, thanks to uh, automated technologies of industrializing the looking at tissue, it becomes conceivable for the first time, I think, to imagine really having a cellular substrate of every single part of the nervous system. And that's what connectomics ultimately aims to do. The idea that the brain is made up of nerve cells has a history that began in around 1870, 1873 about, when a very, very talented Italian histologist named Camillo Golgi, he was 30 years old and he was playing around apparently in his kitchen with a bunch of chemicals and he mixed them together in a particular way that allowed brain tissue to be stained in an extremely inefficient way. Now normally you'd think an inefficient stain would be the worst thing in the world, but that was the magic of his stain. And to this day, it's not exactly clear why it works this way, but the Golgi stain, it now has his name, and he got a Nobel Prize for this work, so it was important to, to be sure, uh, was a technique that caused the crystallization of a dark reaction product in a very small subset of nerve cells. But once the dark reaction product started to crystallize, it filled up the entire cell. But the vast majorities of cells were unlabeled. So you could see a brain cell in a sea of unlabeled cells. And so for the first time, you could see the full complexity of these individual brain cells. That discovery in 1873 uh, prompted a, another remarkable scientist, perhaps the greatest neuroanatomist ever, a man named Ramon E. Cajal, a Spaniard, uh, to start looking at the brain with the Golgi technique. And he was a, a genius of a very unusual type. He was a genius who could see, when he looked at things, he could see more than most people could see. In fact, most people denied that he could possibly have seen what he saw, but he definitely did see it because it has stood the test of time. And what he discovered is that nerve cells uh, have two kinds of processes coming out of the cell body, these little cell bodies that are sort of football shaped. Some of them are local branches that are called dendrites where the cell receives information. These are like antennas for the cell to collect information. And each cell also has one process that goes potentially very far distances called an axon, which is the output of the cell. And he realized that the axons of nerve cells are touching the dendrites of other nerve cells, talking to those dendrites, sending information into the dendrites that then get to the cell body and then get sent out the cell's axon. So there's a directional circuit where the axons of cells are talking to the dendrites of other cells. Those cells are collecting that information and then sending the information on through their own axon to other dendrites of other cells. And in one fell swoop, he sort of figured out how information flowed through the nervous system. And he was right. It's kind of amazing because he was doing this from fixed material stained in a very sparse way. And that kind of worldview has, has, been, has kind of dominated the way we have thought about brains uh, since the time of his discoveries. And he shared the Nobel Prize with Golgi, actually, uh, for his discoveries with that technique. The strength of that approach was the profound um, insight that the brain is made up of nerve cells that have very peculiar shapes. There's a wide range of them, and they have very particular connection patterns. And the weakness of that approach was, unfortunately, a very small subset of nerve cells were stained. So you couldn't say how many different axons converged on the dendrite of a cell, or how many different target cells a particular axon innervated. And it's only with modern techniques that allow us to see all the cells and all the connections that one can kind of fill in this sparse Golgi-like stain now with a complete rendering of what's going on in the brain. The big problem with a field like uh, this is that there is still a huge chasm between what we know about illnesses of behavior, whether they're learning disorders or psychiatric illnesses, and what we know about the structure of the brain. 
So we don't even in normal brains have a good map of how brain cells are arranged relative to each other. So it's not um, surprising, I guess, that we don't yet have any really good ideas at the level of fine circuitry about what is different in the brains for many uh, behavioral disorders and psychiatric diseases. Brains are being mapped extremely well now with tools like functional magnetic resonance imaging or PET scanning. These are remarkable tools and they can non-invasively image entire brains uh, at a resolution of about one cubic millimeter is what each little spot of data is. So the brain is rendered at that resolution. Within one cubic millimeter of brain tissue, we could generate 2,000 terabytes of data, two petabytes of data per cubic millimeter. This is a big data problem because a human brain is about a million cubic millimeters. So that would be about 2 million thousand terabytes or 2 million petabytes, which is comparable to the digital content of the world. I mean, it's a big number. So uh, one of the real drawbacks of connectomics is it's a big data problem in an enormous big data. It's even big data under, under represents how big this data set is. So that is one of our problems. The other is not just if you have the data, but how do you acquire that much data? We are uh, working with a computer, with a, um, a microscope company. Uh, they are building us the fastest electron microscope uh, ever built. Uh, we will take receipt uh, soon. And uh, it images at about 2 billion pixels per second, or 3 terabytes per hour. At that rate, one can do a cubic millimeter in less than a month, as opposed to 50 years. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a big improvement. But still, to do a human brain with a machine like that would be 50 million months. <laughs> so, <laughs> or a million months. I mean, it's just, it, it's still very difficult to find tools that go fast. Now, I should say that genomics, when it began, was very, very slow. I mean, people were by hand pipetting little things, and if you calculated the speed at which it would have taken to do a human genome, people would have been estimating centuries. And now a human genome can be done in a, a day or two. And, and I think once you know how to do it, you can find ways to parallelize and use ever faster machines. So I don't think this is a fundamental limit forever, but we are just at the very beginnings of this field. So this is still a tremendous problem. And, and until computers were around and digitized data and automated machines that were run by computers, it was not even possible to, cons to contemplate doing this kind of project as it is now possible to at least contemplate. I'm not sure do, but at least contemplate doing. I am a... Um, an optimist, to be sure, and uh, we are pushing as hard as we can uh, to make this field a reality. Uh, between the time we started and now, we've had a speed up of several thousand fold. Um, and uh, when our new microscope comes, that will be another speed up of over 50 fold. And, and these speed ups mean that we are moving in the right direction. We're very hopeful that for small animals, uh, we will have full wiring diagrams at some time soon. A human brain is a harder problem, but there may be reasons why after a while it would get boring just as uh, no one would do a full reconstruction of a kidney because once you understand what the motifs are, there's no need to do more. It's possibly that the human brain at some point we would understand it well enough that we'd say we don't need to do any more. We've got the picture. That's my hope. Neuroscience as a field got its start with the Golgi stain. This was the stain that Camille Golgi developed in his kitchen that labeled a small subset of cells that allowed you to see them in their full glory. And you could see them in their flu full glory because it was only labeling a very, very small subset of cells that were randomly distributed amongst many other cells that were not labeled. This was a breakthrough, and it, it revolutionized uh, in the late 1800s our view of how the brain was organized. 
but um, it's not enough. It was insufficient. And over the years, I think people have been thinking about ways of getting more information. You can um, inject cells with dyes. Again, you see a small subset. You can stain tissue to find molecular markers that show you which cells are of a particular type. But if you're interested in circuits, what basically you have to do is see every cell that's connected, each as an individual entity, each as an entity that's separate from every other one. And many of these cells that are separate from each other are not molecularly very different. They just happen to wire differently based on experience. And so we've been trying to come up with techniques that would allow us to see every cell as a unique entity. And we took advantage of this revolution in fluorescent proteins. The green fluorescent protein known as GFP uh, is an amazing discovery that uh, received a Nobel Prize in chemistry a few years back that gives um, an ability to put a genetic insert into the genome of an animal that will make it produce a protein that when you shine one wavelength of light on it, it will give off a fluorescent color that's shifted slightly to longer wavelengths. This is the key about fluorescence, which is you shine, for example, what's known as a black light, an ultraviolet light that you can't see with your own eye, but that can activate pigments that will then glow bright red or bright bright green, and all fluorescent works that, fluorescence works that way. So the green fluorescent protein is a protein where you shine blue light on it and it gives off green light. And shortly after green fluorescent protein was discovered, organic chemists began understanding why it was fluorescent and realized that they could mutate the green fluorescent protein to make a red version or a yellow version, which would f fluoresce different colors. And uh, several groups in Russia for example, discovered that there were a whole range of marine animals that, uh, like corals, that had fluorescent pigments in them that were very similar to green fluorescent protein but different colors. And those gene products could also be put into animals. So now we have a wide range of colors that can be put into animals, but certainly not enough colors to make every cell in the brain a different color. There's not enough colors. but. There is this interesting fact that we humans see all the colors that we see with only three kind of photoreceptors in our own eye. We are only sensitive to red, to green, and to blue. And it's the combination of how much red, green, and blue signal there is in each little part of a visual scene that gives each part its own unique color. So we thought, well, if we could put a random amount of red, green and blue fluorescent protein in each cell, each cell would be some color in the spectrum of the rainbow and we'd be able to see lots of cells. So that's what we did. Jean Levey was a postdoc when he began this work. He now has his own lab in Paris and Josh Sains, a colleague of mine here, uh, and I, uh, with the help of several other really smart young people, built um, a tool that made mice that generated lots of colors in each nerve cell. And it's a form of recombination where you take a genetic insert and you randomly cause a subset of the colors that could be expressed to actually be expressed. So each cell ends up with a rather different color spectrum than each other cell. And this is the brainbow approach and you know we've gone on to make brainbow viruses uh, so that you can inject any animal and infect their brain with with these colors basically to get each cell a different color. So this is a tool that is good for tracing. It's extremely good in the peripheral nervous system. For example, the motor neurons that go to muscle fibers where there's not much else out there. This is great. You can trace wires very long distances. You can map virtually everything in the wiring diagram. When you use tools like Brainbow in the central nervous system and you label everything, you're immediately discouraged by the massive amount of things that are there. And they're so dense that a light microscope often has trouble disambiguating the wires even though you have lots of colors. So we've been trying to think of other ways of, of kind of getting beyond the, the technical difficulties. And one is rather than trying to look through a volume of brain, let's slice the brain really thin. And for us, really thin is about 30 nanometers thick. And a nanometer is, is 
is really small. That's 10 angstroms. That's 10 hydrogen atoms thick. So 30 nanometers is about 1,000th as thick as a human hair. So that's how thick our brain sections are. They're very thin. And we've made an automatic tool. Um, Ken Hayworth and Richard Schleck built this tool that um, cuts brains at that thinness and then picks them up on a conveyor belt of tape. So we end up with this long tape where each section of the brain is 30 nanometers in front of the section before it in this gigantic tape. So you take a volume of brain and you linearize it onto a what looks like a piece of movie film. And then we take a picture of each of those frames, and if you play through that movie, it's like playing through not a time lapse, but a space lapse, where you start in the front of the brain and you go back and you can follow every little wire, every little direction. And so we're using that tool, mainly with electron microscopy now, to trace out virtually every wire. We call it a saturated connectomic reconstruction, where we do connectomics, but we label every single wire and get every single connection. And it's um, dense um, data. It's about 2,000 terabytes per cubic millimeter, so it's a lot of data. And you know we're running out of storage all the time, and uh, <laughs> analysis is a tremendous problem. But we are making great progress, I think, because we started at nowhere. <laughs> we have a wide range of technical problems with this work. I've already mentioned one, which is uh, the fact that the density of the, of the material means that the amount of data you have to collect is extraordinary. And this problem is one that can be solved you know, basically by resources, just buying more storage, hoping the price of storage comes down. It has. You know, when I began, the notion of a gigabyte uh, seemed extraordinary. You know, I, I grew up in the world where my first Macintosh had 512K, and then there was a one megabyte <laughs> Macintosh, which I thought was amazing. So to have uh, memories of gigabytes was remarkable. But then we began dealing in the world of terabytes, and terabytes seemed impossibly large. And now we're saying, okay, terabytes aren't so bad, but petabytes, thousands of terabytes, that's real serious. So I, I have a feeling this is not going to be the, um, the, our Waterloo, you know, where we finally can't go any further. I don't think storage is going to be a big problem, but it is a problem, but it's not the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem, I think, the one that, we're, that still keeps me up every night, is how to analyze this data. We have been analyzing a little piece of mouse brain that is one billionth the size of the whole mouse brain uh, for the past four years. That's all we've been doing is analyzing this one teeny weeny piece. And it's just extraordinary how much you can analyze in something so small. To imagine doing this over larger scales is still very hard. And I have a feeling this is a field that sort of like other fields in biology, is going to be taken over by more talented people, mathematicians, physicists, engineers, computer scientists, and that will generate the data, but then they'll analyze it. Because uh, we're, we're amateurs at anal analysis. We know what's interesting to analyze, but we're not really good at building the tools for analysis. That is it. So I think this is a, a maturation of our field that has not yet really happened, but it's just beginning now. One big question about this field of connectomics and of making tools like this is, what, what do they hold for us in our future? And I would say one extreme view, and maybe uh, an exciting one, is that if you had complete wiring diagrams of the brain, uh, if these tools really gave you that, you could then put those wiring diagrams into something like silicon. You could make a virtual brain that is inspired not just at a distant way, but synapse by synapse inspired by a physical real brain. And therefore, you might have intelligence that is like uh, biological intelligence now instantiated in computers. So that's one interesting uh, idea. Another one that may sound like science fiction, but it's also a very provocative idea at the moment, it's still science fiction, is that once you have a wiring diagram like this, you can send this wiring diagram out into space at the speed of light. And so if an intelligent community somewhere very far away wanted to get a sense of what we're like, uh, instead of sending our bodies 
<laughs> you could send our minds. Genomic imprinting is a very fascinating phenomenon. It um, originates from the fact that um, all our cells uh, possess two copies of each gene. One copy is inherited from mom and the other copy is inherited from dad. So at fertilization, the egg and the sperm fuse their genomic information. And so um, we have half of our genome that is of maternal origin and half of paternal origin. In the, about in the 80s, 1980s, um, it was discovered that these two genes, these two set of genes, do not always behave the same way. And that is the phenomenon of genomic imprinting, which is certain genes are exclusively expressed from the maternal genome and some genes are exclusively expressed from the paternal genome. This was discovered uh, by the early uh, mouse geneticists, in the mouse at least, where um, they were micromanipulating uh, the nucleus of an egg right after fertilization. And at that stage, you can still distinguish the maternal pronucleus and the paternal pronucleus. So the egg and the sperm have just fused, and the two uh, uh, pronuclei that contain the maternal and paternal information have not fused yet, so they are distinguishable. So you can take a micropipette, and you can remove one of the parental pronuclei and replace it by a second one that is identical to the one already there. So in essence, you can generate a zygote, an egg, that has two maternal pronuclei or two paternal pronuclei. In essence, you generate an embryo that instead of having maternal and paternal information has twice the maternal information, twice the paternal information. Now, surprisingly, these embryos do not survive. They, they die relatively quickly, they are unable to thrive, suggesting that there is a complementarity of the genomic information provided by mom and dad. Now, in principle, this is quite surprising because um, all the genes are there, both in the maternal genome and the paternal genome. And so the idea is that although the genes are there, all the genes are there, some are somehow repressed from one of the two uh, um, uh, parental genome, and that's the phenomenon of genomic imprinting. So why would you do this? Having two copies of every gene is an incredible, incredibly important safety mechanism, because if there is a mutation in one gene, there is the second copy from the other parent that can come to the rescue. So why would you voluntarily repress one of the two genes? And David Haig, who is an evolutionary biologist here from Harvard, emitted the hypothesis that um, there's something special about imprinted genes. In fact, there's something special about organism that uh, uh, undergo the phenomenon of genomic imprinting. Genomic imprinting um, is only observed in plants and in placental mammals. What's happening in placental mammals? Well, mom. Uh, uh, invest an enormous, res enormous resources um, into the growth of the embryo and, and the growth of the offspring. And so according to his hypothesis, this generates a battle between uh, mom and dad through their genome, such that dad would like its offspring to grow as much as possible. And so the paternal genome tend to promote embryonic growth. And mom, through her genome, uh, wants the embryo to grow, but not too much, because she needs to keep resources for all the progeny. And dad is not interested in all the progeny or um, future leaders or future infant, because those are likely to be from another dad. You know, the majority of um, mammals are uh, polygamous. So mom has offspring from one dad and then has another set of offspring from a, a second dad. So dad obviously doesn't want 
uh, offspring from another dad. He wants to promote his own progeny. And so that's the idea that there's this battle uh, between the maternal and the paternal genome. So this was only a hypothesis. And as it turns out, um, a couple of years later, the first imprinted genes were discovered, and the first uh, maternally expressed, sorry, the first paternally expressed gene is a growth factor called IGF2, and the first maternally expressed gene uh, discovered is an IGF2 receptor, which is a truncated receptor that impairs the function of IGF2. So here was, uh, to some extent, uh, the first demonstration of this hypothesis, which is uh, the gene expressed from Dan, IGF2, promotes embryonic growth, and the gene expressed from the maternal genome uh, impairs uh, or, or limits, I should say, embryonic growth. So this is the first set of imprinted gene discovered that fits this kinship theory. Other genes have been found that also fit this theory. Since then, uh, a very large number of genes have been discovered. Some fit this uh, uh, kinship conflict and some uh, do not and fit very well with other theories that have been um, uh, emitted uh, around genomic imprinting. But so this is all about the embryo and the conflict in the embryo. As it turns out, from the hundred or so imprinted genes that have been discovered and that are important for embryonic growth, many of them, the majority of them, are expressed in the brain, in the adult brain. And so this really uh, triggered for us a very interesting question, which is, what are these imprinted genes doing in the brain? Is there a conflict in the brain between the maternal and the paternal genome, uh, the way there seem to be a conflict in the embryo? In other words, what are these imprinted genes doing? To some extent, this maternal-paternal conflict, uh, you could imagine some, uh, some sort of psychoanalysis reinvented, which is mom and dad uh, telling their offspring what to do, and they don't agree on what the offspring should be doing, so you have this conflict uh, in the brain. So uh, several years, a couple of years ago, actually five, five years ago, uh, we decided to try to uh, look at genomic imprinting in the brain. Since there are so many imprint, non-imprinted genes that are expressed there, could we even find more that are only imprinted in the brain? So we uh, developed a, a genome-wide strategy that is based on uh, new sequencing technologies, and <clears throat> we use this strategy to uh, identify all the repertoire of gene imprinted genes, so the imprintome, if you wish, of the embryonic brain, the adult cortex, and the adult hypothalamus. And to our surprise, uh, we identify a very large number of genes, uh, over a thousand genes. And what was interesting is that not only we found many genes that had never been reported to be imprinted before, but even more interestingly, we found that these genes were differentially imprinted in different brain regions. So some genes are imprinted in the embryo, some genes are imprinted in the cortex, some genes are imprinted in the hypothalamus, and many are not imprinted all over those uh, three brain areas. Since then, uh, we've looked at other brain areas. We also refine our, our uh, strategy. Um, Genome-wide expression analysis have enormously evolved, and the statistical analysis has also evolved. And we are now, uh, in, we have in our hand, uh, these very interesting genes that have a differential expression from the maternal and the paternal genome. So why is this important? Well, what we think is happening is that by silencing one of the two parental copies, uh, a neuron or a brain area is trying to regulate the dosage of certain genes and that the regulation of gene dosage is essential for proper brain function. In fact, there are quite a number of um, neurological diseases um, in which improper gene dosage leads to catastrophic uh, um, impairment of brain function. Uh, they are uh, many, many examples of, of, of such. And so we think that the genes that we have identified are preferentially expressed from either the maternal or the paternal genome, 
uh, this preferential expression is not always very strong. It could be 60% from the maternal genome, 40% from the paternal genome, but many genes are affected. And so globally, um, these really may have a very strong impact on the way a neuron function in a particular brain area. So the uh, next question really is indeed if we are uh, experimentally challenging the system, which means that if we artificially change the dosage of certain genes, uh, can we observe uh, changes in normal neuronal function? And what we also hope is that, um, as you know, there are many genome-wide analysis of polymorphism and trying to associate mutation in certain genes uh, with uh, certain mental disorders. And we think that the, um, the inheritance of some of these mutations from either the maternal lineage or the paternal lineage might have an enormous impact on how serious the disease will be. So if a gene, for example, is preferentially expressed from the maternal genome, if the mutation is inherited from mom, then this will have a, a larger effect on uh, neuronal function than if the mutation is inherited from the paternal lineage in which that particular gene is less expressed. So what we hope to, um, to be able to do is correlate more uh, tightly um, the origin of certain mutation together with the severity of, of certain diseases. The genes uh, are encoded into a sequence of nucleic acid, and these reside on a very long strand of DNA. So that's the basis of the genetic information that we carry and that we inherit from our parents. But the DNA is not naked in our cells. Um, it's uh, surrounded and, and protected and organized by a set of proteins and nucleic acid that forms this very complex structure called the chromatin. The chromatin really um, is regulating the way genes are expressed by um, enabling certain areas of the genome to be accessible and also by interacting with transcription factors and all sorts of regulators of gene expression. People who've been studying uh, chromatin and gene regulation uh, realized uh, relatively recently um, that there is information not only on the DNA itself, but also on the chromatin. And in particular, uh, some essential uh, constituent of the chromatin called histone, the histone molecules, uh, in, around which the DNA is uh, uh, enrolled, um, are themselves carrying some information by being modified uh, as part of networks of gene regulation. And uh, David Alice, in particular, uh, was uh, instrumental in identifying histone modifications that in turn affect very strongly the ability of a gene to be transcribed or modulate the ability to be transcribed. So some histone modification help to silence a gene or repress its expression and some other histone modification seems to be associated with uh, an, an upregulation of, of the expression of that particular gene. Now, what are these, all these marks good for? Well, one idea is that um, when a cell is encountering a particular signal in its, in, in its environment, it wants to keep some type of cellular memory and change maybe its metabolism accordingly. So that's the field of chromatin biology, is to try to understand the relationship between the environment and gene expression and the chromatin in general. So where is the brain here? Well, if you think about the brain, the role of the brain in large part is to respond to the environment and to, um, to learn from its environment. So every neuron uh, wants to have uh, its function to be modulated by 
past experience. So there is here something very uh, similar or parallel in terms of uh, process. A cell wants to learn from its environment and change its chromatin. The brain want also is a learning machine. And so um, molecular neuroscientists uh, have recently uh, postulated that neurons in the brain could be using some of these essential mechanisms to modify chromatin to in turn modulate the function of neurons. This is a relatively recent field and so we are mainly right now at what I would say what I would call an observational phase. It has been observed that uh, mutants or molecules that are involved in neuronal memory, in brain learning, uh, some of them are chromatin constituent. And I think Eric Kandel was among the uh, first scientists to indeed involve some of this chromatin machinery into the phenomenon of neuronal learning and, and, um, and memory in the brain. Moreover, uh, there are a number of key uh, molecules involved in chromatin biology uh, that uh, were found to be responsible for um, some uh, mental disorders and, and neurological dysfunction. So again, there is this relationship between uh, the chromatin and brain function. So it seems to be the case that um, when a neuron is excited, then there are all sorts of changes occurring at the level of the synapses. But some changes also are, or some signals are sent to the nucleus and leading in turn to changes in the chromatin that will affect gene expression for short term, medium term, and, and probably even long term. So what is the molecular basis of memory? Some of it could be residing in the chromatin. I've been speaking only about uh, histone modification, but there are all sort of other changes of the chromatin or the DNA. For example, uh, uh, the uh, methylation of some bases of some nucleotides uh, uh, methylcytosine, for example, could be a vector of uh, some form of, of uh, epigenetic changes in neurons. And more recently, uh, 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, so a slightly different form of methylated basis, also has been involved in brain function. So, as I mentioned, we are to a large extent mainly right now at an observ observational phase, which is that scientists um, put neurons or brain in specific context of stress, for example, or, um, or, or, or firing uh, regimes, and then they look at how the chromatin changes. And then they correlate changes in neuronal function with these changes in chromatin. But um, we really uh, lack the direct proof uh, that these changes are mechanistically involved in, uh, in memory, in learning. And this is very difficult to do. If you're working with, let's say, fibroblast or muscle cell, you can observe them into a dish and you can do all sorts of manipulation that will prove a direct functional link between a change and then the change in cellular properties. But here you're dealing with the neuron and more complicated. You're dealing with a set of neurons organized in a particular area of the brain. And so experiments are much more difficult to do. And we're really lacking some of the tools to you know, precisely change one of these um, uh, chromatin modification and, and see what's happening to brain function. Uh, we are getting there. There are all sorts of new genetic engineering that enable or will enable uh, uh, those studies to be performed. But these are still at the level of hypothesis. They are fascinating hypotheses because if indeed um, some basis of learning and memory reside in chromatin changes, one could imagine to um, uh, develop specific drugs that would help uh, the mechanism of learning and memory by acting specifically on those changes. And there are in fact all sorts of uh, 
drug development or assays of drug development that uh, are inspired by this line of research. So the question is, you know, why are we not uh, moving forward? Why are we not um, doing these mechanistic experiments uh, right away or immediately, right now? What we lack are specific uh, drugs, or specific reagents, and those reagents could be molecules like drugs or they could be uh, experimental strategies. I guess the, the key puzzle is that these chromatin changes occur throughout the genome. They, go, they can affect every single gene, but they don't. They affect only specific genes. And what we really don't understand is how is the cell able to select which genes will be modified by uh, a specific histone change, for example, or, or DNA methylation. So what we're lacking really are the ability to um, target a specific gene and say, oh, if I change the histones around that specific genes into another type of modification, what will happen to the entire function of the cell? We don't know how to do that. We have reagents that can affect that particular histone modification throughout the genome, but to a particular gene, we, we don't know how to do this. So some people are right now in their labs inventing new strategies and hopefully some of those will work and we will be able to move forward in a more mechanistic sense. The future of the field is uh, probably enormous. I mean, it's a bet right now that this histone modification or DNA methylation are uh, not only highly dynamic and highly regulated, but they are functionally extremely important. Just to understand how the brain works, uh, this is a fundamental part of the brain, the nucleus of all the neurons. How do they change? And uh, can we see the fluctuation of gene expression associated with different states of the brain. So from a basic standpoint, this is just one large part of understanding how the brain works. And uh, the aspect that is immediately related to this is if we understand um, some aspect of brain function, we can also hopefully um, understand better the origin of some mental disorders. So the free energy principle um, originally emerged from systems neuroscience as a way, a principled way, of understanding what the brain does and how it does it. Subsequently, the principles proved to be so simple and so powerful that they've been applied in a variety of contexts now. So one could almost regard the free energy principle as a, an organising principle for any living system that shows the, the characteristics of life. So. The reason I start like that is that there are two roads to explaining or understanding the free energy principle. We can either start from the perspective of people like Helmholtz in the 19th century, trying to understand unconscious inference in the brain and build a story through uh, analysis by synthesis and psychology, through to current um, and exciting developments in machine learning, things like Geoffrey Hinton's Helmholtz machine and then how that has become contextualised in the inactivist or the embodied cognition context um, and generalising these notions and you end up with the free energy principle. Or you can start from the top and just ask very simple questions about what it is to be alive. And if you are alive and you exist, what sorts of behaviours must you show? And in fact, if you answer those questions, you end up with exactly the same answers that you would have got had you followed the historical route. For brevity, I'll take the high road. I'll go from uh, the, the, um, the minimalist assumptions that um, things exist and just try and unpack that and show how one can get to notions of the brain as an imprint engine, sometimes called the Bayesian brain hypothesis, uh, the brain as uh, one of the best examples of an organ that is actively constructing explanations for its own sampling of the world. So 
this, active, this inactive perspective is very important because not only does the brain then have to explain all the sensory input, it also has to choose which sensory input to sample. It is in charge of gathering information, evidence for its own predictions and own beliefs about the world. But I've jumped ahead, so now I have to explain to you why is it that any system that exists will behave as if it has a model of the world and it's trying to gather evidence for its own model of the world. So the story starts just by acknowledging that if you want to talk about something, there has to be a separation between the thing you're talking about and everything else. And in fact, if there were no boundaries, there would be nothing, because there would be no distinction between a thing and not that thing. So statistically speaking, that distinction or that boundary is called a Markov blanket. Um, it's just a mathematical way of separating states of some abstract world, system, organism, culture, life, cell, brain, um, into things that are internal to the boundary, that are owned by that system, and things that are outside the boundary that are external to the system. So it could be a cell and its milieu. It could be a phenotype, it could be me and my environment. It could be, well, at any scale, there has to be this division. Now, the very existence of that separation, that Markov blanket, in conjunction with the assumption that that system exists over time tells you something quite profound about the behaviour of the internal states and the states that constitute the Markov blanket. This is a bit abstract, but it's actually quite simple. The Markov blanket has two bits to it. There's the sensory states that are just defined because they don't influence the external states, but they do influence the internal states, so it's sensory information, for example, would be mediated by sensory states as I get from the outside world into my internal world, my brain. And there are active states that go in the other direction. So they, are in, they influence external states but are not influenced by the external states. They are actually dependent upon the internal states. So um, if I take me as a model of my world, my active states would be how I am currently moving whereas my sensory states would be the activity of my photoreceptors, all the sensory organs and sensory epithelia I had at my disposal. Let's put that Markov blanket aside for one moment and just think what it means for a system to exist over periods of time. What that means is that it is effectively resisting a dispersion by random fluctuations. So. Perhaps the simplest example here would be if I dropped um, uh, or placed a drop of ink in a cup of water, then almost immediately it would start to disperse as random fluctuations dispersed all the molecules around. Um, and I would not call that drop of ink a living drop of ink because it has dispersed. If, however, I place the drop of ink in some water and then, to your amazement, you saw it gather itself up, then relax a bit, and then gather itself up again, like it was breathing, as if time was reversed. You would say, there's something very peculiar about that drop of ink. It's almost as if it was living. And you become quickly convinced it was alive. And the only reason you endow it with the property of self-organized life, biotic self-organization, is that it's not dispersing. And the only reason it's not dispersing is that all of its internal states and its Markov blanket that separates it from the rest of the water are moving towards the centre of the drop. They, so that the flow of the molecules of the system is exactly countering the dispersive forces that are trying to disperse it throughout the water. Now that flow, operationally or mathematically, can provably be shown to be simply um, moving uphill on the probability distribution of where the ink molecules should be. And that probability distribution, mathematically, is also the same as something called Bayesian model evidence. 
I can't, I don't have time to go into it, but is this a beautiful observation that the, the defining dynamics of any system that does not dissipate over time is that they, on average, will move or f their states will flow so as to maximize model evidence, Bayesian model evidence. So that means that if a system exists, then it will appear to maximize Bayesian model evidence. It will appear to be a little Bayesian engine. It will appear as if it has a model of its world. Why? Well, because that system, let's now go back to the Markov blanket, that comprises the active and sensory states and the, uh, and the internal states that are encompassed by the Markov blanket. The law, the rule, which says that all of the states must, must maximize model evidence, which is um, also known as marginal likelihood, that is also um, in inverse upper bounded by free energy, hence the free energy principle. All of those states have to maximize marginal likelihood or minimize free energy, including action. That means action and sensations and the internal states are all doing the same thing, which means that we can understand the internal states of the brain as modeling the world because they are maximizing the Bayesian model evidence for me or a model of the world. At the same time, my action is also trying to maximize the evidence for my model of the world. So put very simply, almost by definition, I am in the game of garnering information that maximizes the evidence for my own existence. And that's basically the free energy principle. It's a corollary or a consequence of any system that doesn't dissipate. It looks as if it has to behave as if it is maximizing, actively soliciting information from the environment and modeling that information as a model of the environment to maximize the evidence for its own existence. And that's where we started with the long history of the um, Helmholtz's notion of unconscious inference right through to modern day machine learning formulations, uh, for example, uh, the, the Helmholtz machine of uh, Jeffrey Hinton and Peter Dyer. That can be unpacked at many, many different levels and it has provided a very useful framework within which to understand how that free energy principle is complied with by the biology and the anatomy and the physiology of the brain. What it tells you is that the anatomy of any system has to contain with it a model of the environment in which that system is immersed. Which means that if we live in a world that has some deep hierarchical structure in which there is action at a distance, for example, you know, so that um, the colour of objects around me is determined by the incident light as it comes almost instantaneously to my eye or a falling body is caused by gravity, then my brain must recapitulate that causal structure. And of course it does. The very fact we have nerve cells with long slender connections connecting each other at a distance speaks exactly to the fact that the causal architectures of the world that we inhabit have this action at a distance and this sparse connectivity. Furthermore, the hierarchical structure of the world is recapitulated in the neuronal structures that constitute the hierarchies of the connectome or the uh, hierarchical disposition of uh, functionally specialized brain areas. If the brain is truly a statistical model of the world it inhabits, can we understand some fundaments of brain organizations such as um, the distinction between what and where streams in the brain. So a very powerful observation, a principle of uh, functional specialization is that where processing for a stream of brain areas roughly down here and a more dorsal stream is concerned with what. That may be a simple reflection of the fact that we live in a universe where different things can be in different positions. So that we can statistically separate the whatness from the whereness. If we lived in a universe where whenever something moved, it also changed its nature, we couldn't do that. So just by looking at the brain, I can tell you the sort of universe that you inhabit under the free energy principle, under the assumption that your brain has become a model of 
the environment that it inhabits. The free energy principle has been quite useful from uh, my perspective and that of my colleagues, um, largely because it um, shows the connections between previous theories. Um, so there are many um, global brain theories that have been brought to bear, for example, um, the principle of minimum redundancy and maximum efficiency, notions of the brain extracting as much information as it can from the environment. There are other um, theories um, that speak to how we select and value certain behaviours. It's useful to see how all of these become special cases of a variational principle, which um, in this instance is the, is the uh, free energy principle. Which means that you can, you can now talk to different disciplines um, and see how one particular construct, theoretical and all the empirical evidence, speaks to another theoretical construct and uh, essentially see how they're approaching the same problem from different perspectives. Because you've got a principle framework, it also allows you to um, make very particular hypotheses about the process theories that would be that would conform to the principle. So I've, all I've said so far is that, uh, in principle, every internal state, every action I make, every sensation that I gather, should be in the service of minimising variation free energy or maximising marginal likelihood. How? How do you do that? How does a brain do that? But if you know what the objective function is, if you know what the process, the, 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 the imperatives are, you can then cast it uh, in terms of processes. So for example, I can say, well, this minimization of variation free energy or maximization of uh, basic model evidence is a hill climbing or gradient descent algorithm. So I can now write down a differential equation where everything, every neuronal um, state, physiological variable in the brain now becomes describable as a differential equation given other states in the brain. And if that equation is true, then I can now go and map the variables to physiological processes. And if one plays that game, you can, get an in, you, you can go an enormous way in starting to understand not just the anatomy, but also the physiology. And also you can generate questions, because there are alternative process theories that all conform with the same principle. So does the brain use uh, sampling uh, techniques to maximise model evidence or does it use um, hill climbing optimization schemes, variational schemes? So that you start to generate a whole um, testable raft of hypotheses pertaining to the process theory that are all consistent with the overarching principle. Today I would like to talk about the following topic. This is my hand. This is my head. My nose. I have no discussion that this is belonging to me. This body is my body. And possibly you feel your body to be your body and nobody else's body. But possibly this feeling of ownership is a feeling that we construct every second of our lifetime in our brain. It is not given by nature, it is constructed. And if it is constructed, can we change it? The answer is yes. Let's make a very, very simple experiment, incredibly simple. If you read more about it, just go to your computer and type in rubber hand illusion. You will see a lot of nice videos of this very simple illusion. You can test it on yourself. It works. What you need is a rubber hand. I don't have a rubber hand here, but I've drawn you a hand, a very simple one. Let's suppose I am the subject of the experiment. There is a little wall here. There is a rubber hand placed here. It's a three-dimensional rubber hand, incredibly simple. And it's put placed here, and it's absolutely easy for me to see that this is not my body. This is made of rubber, an artificial hand. So the experimenter tells me, this is a rubber hand, just look at this hand. And please put your hand here. 
are you able to see your hand? And I say, no, I cannot see my hand. Okay, the experimenter says, let's start. Now comes a person who has a stroking pen in both hands. With one hand, they stroke the thumb of the rubber hand. And simultaneously, they stroke my thumb. So I looking at the stroking movements on the thumb of the rubber hand, and I'm feeling the same movements and the same touch on my real hand. They go with the index finger, my index finger, middle finger, my middle finger, etc. I did not expect a strong illusion. I tell you, my illusion was there after 25 seconds. I suddenly had the feeling of, this is my hand. And when you test subjects, you can show that the temperature of your real hand drops by 4 degrees within a minute. That means your body is reducing the blood flow into your real hand because this is now part of your body. That means so fast you incorporate something else into the, your body schema with something so simple. The only thing that you have to do is to use the language of your brain. So what is the language of your brain? The language of your brain is synchronicity of nerve impulses. When the visual aspect of stroking is synchronous with the felt aspects of stroking. You have nerve cells that are synchronously active. Visual cells, somatosensory cells. And these nerve impulses are jointly coming together in the brain, creating the feeling of, this is part of my body. That means you can change the way you think about your own body. You can even go further. Swiss scientists have done a beautiful experiment. What they did was they asked subjects to enter their laboratory and put on virtual reality glasses. The only thing that these people could see was to see themselves standing in front of them with the back towards them. It's very simple. There was a camera behind them, taking the picture of, their, of them standing in the lab. So that's what these people saw. They saw themselves standing in front of them. Obviously, they understood that this is just the picture of the camera, and not themselves. It's just a camera picture. Now comes the trick. The Swiss scientists took a long stick and stroked the subjects at their back. And what the people saw during their virtual reality device was the same stroking movement at the back of the person in front of them. A synchronous feeling of somatosensory input and the visual aspect of seeing this in front of them. And what subjects report is, it feels like also standing there. So being in front of you, not here, in front of you. This is very strange. Does this reflect also diseases of the human brain where people, for example, after brain damages, have changes in the way they um, perceive their own body. Yes. Especially after lesions of the right part of the brain. Some patients report that this is not my hand. It's not my hand. It's the hand of somebody else. That means 
after the brain lesion, people can have the feeling of not being able to accept their own left hand as part of their body. In most extreme cases, some people say, this left hand makes me unhappy. Please cut it off. It doesn't belong to me. It's not part of my body. In other patients with epileptic seizures, there are reports that these people say during an epileptic seizure that somebody moves into their body so that for a few minutes the left part of their body is in the control of somebody else. And it is somebody else. While this part of the body is me, this part of the body is another person. All of that shows that we construct ourselves. And this construction can change with lesions of the brain and with simple procedures like rubber hand illusions. That would now imply that the feeling of me, of myself, is something that can change in a second. Well, there is also some stability involved. It's a strange thing of being somebody else and being stably me. What does that mean? It means the following. I give you an example from a person in Switzerland again who unfortunately died a couple of years ago. She had a genetic disease. She was born without arms and without hands. So never in her life did she have a body schema including arms and legs. With other words, it's not that she had arms when she was young and they were, they were lost in an accident. She never ever had them. But now listen what she reports. She says, sometimes when I'm having a free time, I sit on my sofa, I put my legs onto the pillow, and I enjoy my life. Her legs onto the pillow. And when somebody comes into the room and sits on my legs that don't exist, in that second my legs disappear. But when the person stands up, the legs are there again. Scientists in the beginning did not believe her. They said it's just a fantasy of a woman who wants to have legs and arms. But she could prove that this is true. How was this proven? <laughs> they put this person into a brain scanner and say, please now move your arms or please now move your legs. Her brain activity in the motor planning regions is identical to the brain activity of people with legs and arms, not in the primary motor cortex but in the motor planning fields. And then scientists did the critical test. They used a system that is called transcranial magnetic stimulation, abbreviation TMS, with which you put a coil onto a certain part of the, of the skull and then give an electric pulse. This is then translated into a magnetic field that goes into your skull and then again creates an electric field in your brain. With this, you can activate certain parts of your cortex. Now they said to this woman, okay, look, sometimes I will give you an electric pulse. Sometimes I will not give you an electric pulse. 
you will not know when I give you an electric pulse and when I don't give you an electric pulse. But you have to tell me whether your arms or legs move after one of these events, electric pulse given or maybe not given. So the person was sitting there, the TMS device on its skull, and let's assume they said, now, but there was no impulse. And she said, my arms don't move. And then they said, now, but this time they gave an electric pulse. And she said, my right arm move, moves, my left leg moves, whatever the aim of the TMS system was. That means she was born without arms and legs, but her brain had constructed arms and legs, and they never vanished, although she never had arms and legs. What does that all mean? It means we are born with a body in our brain. And this body in our brain has a certain stability over lifetime. But when we sometimes have a major brain injury, we can think that this is no longer our arm or hand. And when we speak the language of the brain, which is synchronicity, we can alter the body map of our body within seconds. At that level, I am a construction. And you, my friend, you're also a construction every second of your life. To talk about um, brain networks in, uh, in uh, neuroscience, we have to define why the notion of networks is important and how we came up with, uh, with that uh, new concept. And basically, we have to look back at, at the revolution of uh, looking at brain activity and brain function with brain imaging or techniques over the past 20, 25 years. And this, this, these modalities, these uh, methods, basically, have uh, been very good at... Um, informing us about what brain regions are uh, present, if you will, or are activated when someone is, you know, producing language or uh, listening to speech sounds or uh, using working memory or uh, looking at faces or... Anyway, so what, what these techniques have been showing us is basically a mosaic of uh, regions in the brain that supposedly are necessary Uh, in a certain function, in a certain role. And, you know, this uh, we have uh, inherited from this long tradition of anatomists who have um, basically mapped the brain with surgical tools um, to basically isolate uh, a certain portion of the brain as if it were responsible for a certain function. So there has been this tradition of assigning one function to one brain region. Uh, one very good example of that is uh, Broca's region, which is a, a little portion of the inferior frontal lobe, especially on the left side, which uh, in uh, some patients can be impaired by a brain lesion and has to be removed by the surgeon. And this is how Broca basically uh, gave his name to that uh, small region. And in these patients, what happens is that when the, this, uh, this region is uh, impaired or is absent, then language functions is also impaired. So, and that's only one, one of the many examples that basically we have learned from surgical approaches to understand brain function. And interestingly, this has, uh, you know, continued uh, through the revolution of brain mapping uh, using brain imaging techniques and until, uh, you know, um, recently where uh, basically we realized that, okay, this approach is really not satisfying. And you see uh, in many different uh, experimental settings, probing different brain functions, you know, the same brain regions being activated. And also there is this realization that, of course, anatomically, everything is pretty much connected to everything uh, in the brain through the, these long highways of communication uh, made of uh, axon, ax axons and white fibers. So anatomically, the brain is, a, is certainly a network, 
And therefore, we need to resort to maybe new tools and new concepts to basically understand better uh, brain function. So this has been definitely a revolution over the past, I would say, five plus years in, uh, in neuroscience and in brain mapping in particular. So we are looking at um, this already complex uh, system and complex object, anatomically and physiologically speaking, but uh, we are now uh, in uh, the necessity of you resorting to also more sophisticated tools to basically um, you know, extract uh, the necessary uh, information from the data we capture with brain imaging. Um, so if I can explain in a little bit more details, for instance, uh, the different approaches, um, basically the, uh, what happens is that we are looking at anatomically at um, this uh, organization of the brain as uh, regions that are, you know, at different scales, basically, reveal um, a, a certain hierarchy of connectivity. So there is this notion of connectivity of the functional co connectome of the brain that has uh, developed over the past few years. And when you look at cells with a microscope, they are really the neuronal cells of the brain and others, um, other, other types of cells, they are tightly interconnected and they form little assemblies of neurons that are usually, when one is active, it's very likely that the other one, the other neighbors are very active also. And in that respect, they form a, net, a small network. But if you step back a little bit and you look at a different scale, then this kind of organization uh, remains. And fundamentally, when you start to study uh, the architecture of brain interconnections using, for instance, diffusion-weighted MRI, what you see is and what you see are you know tightly interconnected uh, regions, but not in a random manner. Obviously, evolution uh, has basically made this organization very. Um, with, I mean, has provided uh, uh, this organization with a beautiful and very efficient architecture. So what, what we learn from the anatomy, what we see in the anatomy of, uh, of uh, the interconnections of the brain is that um, basically there are these huge, uh, these massive highways of communication through the, uh, the axonal bundles, the white fiber uh, underneath the, the cortical uh, mantle, the gray matter. And um, if you uh, look at how, how one brain region is interconnected with another one uh, that you randomly select, well, everything is connected to everything in the brain, but usually with a one to two to three maybe uh, uh, steps uh, and intermediate steps of communication, and which makes the, um, the brain look like a small world kind of um, universe. So this notion of small world interconnection and network uh, was actually developed not in brain science, but in sociology, where there, there was this famous experiment back in the 1960s, uh, where you can demonstrate that uh, everyone is, in, is interconnected with anyone else in a society with a maximum degree of, with at maximum six degrees of interconnection. So I could um, basically, um, uh, get in touch with, for instance, uh, the president with, uh, by resorting to my closed uh, uh, social network and f little by little um, and uh, exploring this network of social interactions, I would reach to any particular person uh, in the world, including the president uh, uh, of Russia, for instance. Um, so... This uh, has been these techniques, the mathematic, mathematical techniques to explain uh, uh, the, the properties of a given network, given its uh, architecture, uh, were translated into what mathematicians have called uh, graph theory. So it's, a, it's an entire subfield of mathematics that basically, you know, developed the tools and the notions and the, and the formal concepts to basically uh, apply measures uh, on networks. So certain network architectures are more efficient than others uh, in terms of uh, uh, broadcasting information from one point to any other point in the network. Some others are more efficient in terms of resilience 
to attacks or to uh, um, insults to the architecture. And that's very pertinent to, brain, to the brain, of course, because the brain processes information and to process information, different brain regions need to work together. And this is how the brain is wired. And um, for that to properly evaluate and test hypotheses, scientific hypotheses about brain communication, we need to have the proper tools to work on experimental data. So we have now, since the past five to 10 years, uh, absorbed some of these uh, you know, uh, applied aspects of uh, graph theory uh, to basically apply new measures on, on brain maps. So instead of looking at very static maps of um, you know, brain regions that light up uh, when the subject is performing a language task versus a visual task, then we are looking at integrated measures uh, of uh, collaboration, so to speak, in the brain, uh, inspired by these uh, mathematical tools. So the, the concept of the human connectome is, uh, has been uh, you know, emerging, and it's an entire new field of uh, uh, integrative neuroscience, uh, which makes it very um, exciting for the next few years ahead of us. Because this is really, uh, we realize that it's, it's how basically the brain works. Uh, and this is how we should now uh, consider um, basically a science of an integrative and multidisciplinary science of, uh, of um, brain function uh, by looking at how brain anatomy enables brain function and how brain function may also shape some aspects of uh, brain development, in including in how uh, the, the different brain regions are wired. And it's also very uh, pertinent to look at it uh, in um, clinical or preclinical neuroscience as well, because more and more uh, brain disorders are, you know, um, approached and studied um, with a network science kind of um, perspective. For instance, a, a great example of that is uh, concerns the psychiatric disorders and mental health uh, issues where basically you scan someone who is affected with schizophrenia or major depression, um, and you don't see very clear or if any, uh, you know, um, disparity or differences with a healthy brain, anatomically speaking, but also if you do brain functional uh, imaging uh, on these persons, you don't see very clear differences. However, uh, if you look at it from a brain network perspective, um, and use these new tools and emerging tool of, uh, of um, functional connectivity. Uh, there are studies that report that actually the differences are more in how the brain uh, is interconnected in these syndromes. The new tools of brain network analysis have revealed that, uh, I mean, some very pertinent and very significant changes in the wiring, if you will, and even the integrative functions of this, uh, of this patient's brain that were, could not be seen at the anatomical level or just the basic mapping level of brain activity. So um, this is definitely a new dimension in uh, how we look at the brain and how we study the brain and how we use the techniques to basically analyze uh, experimental data from, from healthy controls but also patients. So now the question is, okay, what are the mechanisms that uh, basically enable uh, the, uh, you know, the communication in the brain or miscommunication in the case of uh, clinical studies? And this is very much an open question um, these days because it's a complex one. Uh, like I said at the beginning, um, we have to look at things at different scales and understand how you know, cells communicate with one another at a smaller scale, and how this basically pass through the different scales of uh, neural assemblies, regional brain activity, and then inter-regional uh, functional connectivity at the whole brain scale. And so this is a very, very active field of, uh, of research in neuroscience uh, these days, and it's a complex one because we need to have access to a reasonable you know, uh, spatial resolution uh, so that we can assess functional connectivity at the global uh, uh, level. So we need to have full coverage of the brain and not only a few electrodes, you know, for instance, implanted in, um, in the brain to see what's happening at a very small unit, at a very small scale. 
So, and we need also millisecond temporal resolution, which is really the natural speed of the brain, so that we can, we can really um, elaborate models and test these models with experimental data to understand how basically functional connectivity emerges uh, in brain networks. So um, one remarkable thing is that, uh, you know, when electrophysiology was pretty much invented and, uh, and developed back, back in uh, the late 19th century and early uh, 20th century, what uh, scientists basically measured in the first place were brain oscillations or brain rhythms. And um, these oscillations are, you know, everywhere in the brain. This is a natural uh, property that emerges from cell assemblies at different scales. So that makes it a very interesting marker. Like I was saying before, we need to have a marker of brain activity that can be accessed and uh, can be pertinent at different scales from cell assemblies to the whole brain. So in that respect, oscillations uh, uh, really address this kind of, uh, of challenge. And now one entire field of research is looking at uh, the possibility of how, or how these oscillations could enable brain communication and neural communication, especially at long distances. So um, the brain basically generates these rhythms from you know, very slow oscillations, sometimes one cycle, per a few seconds, if not more, to very fast uh, in the range of uh, you know, one cycle per millisecond, sometimes at the maximum. So this is a real range. It's like a repertoire of uh, different rhythms and that can enable different aspects of um, um, you know, uh, uh, synchronization between the brain regions at different scales again. So one very active field of research in, in brain imaging and neuroscience these days with time-resolved techniques is to basically understand how these different frequencies and brain rhythms basically coexist and can be coupled and decoupled very dynamically as the brain is resting or resolving a, a certain problem, performing a certain task relating to behavior and also brain function and dysfunction. So. Um, these aspects of brain synchrony are is really or, or oscillatory synchronies in different ways is really um, a very is a very promising uh, subfield of uh, neuroscience these days to look at brain networks indeed. So um, if we want to speak about uh, computational modeling of the brain, we have to look at the notion of uh, the brain as a computer, maybe. Um, it's one aspect, it's one's perspective on, on the question. In the notion of uh, computational modeling of the brain, there is this idea that the brain can be, um, you know, identified as a computer or could be reduced as a computer. So we can discuss about that uh, philosophically and, uh, and technically. But if we simplify things and looking at the computer, there is the hardware part and the software. And I think it's not exaggerated to say that the hardware part of the brain is relatively well understood. And uh, we understand, for in instance, the architecture of uh, uh, the organization of the brain as a structure, as, a, as different elements in, at different scales. And in that respect, there is a, a great deal of uh, efforts in research these days of uh, implementing this architecture using um, simulations on software, but also actual implementation on uh, computer chips, which uh, architecture is actually that of uh, elementary assemblies of uh, neural cells. So we call these uh, approaches neuromorphic in the sense that you really want to, or you proceed to implementing um, an architecture in a substrate that is not biological, that really mimics uh, the brain. And then you would hope that by using this uh, these, uh, these architecture, you would learn about brain function, or you would basically uh, proceed at, um, or you would obtain results that would be, um, you know, at least equivalent to in performance to that of the brain. And the performance is uh, both in terms of um, computational power, 
which is, uh, I think we can agree, quite high for the, for the brain, but also in terms of efficiency. Uh, and I, I think it's even the greatest attraction, because uh, to give you an idea uh, in terms of computational power uh, of uh, reduced to the number of operations that uh, the brain is able to perform, first we need to look at um, basically the number of uh, little components that uh, can perform operations. So, of course, we think about neurons. And so, typically, in the human brain, there, is around, there are around 100 billion uh, neurons. But it's not only the neurons that perform the computation. You can even reduce the elementary computations and operations to that of the synapses. And every neuron is typically uh, interconnected with other neurons in the order of 1,000 to 10,000 synapses. So you multiply 100 billion by about 1,000 or 10,000, and you end, up, you end up with a quadrillion of elementary operations that can be performed by the brain, and it's at a, a certain moment. And uh, the brain is extremely dynamic and can, per can perform anywhere between maybe 10 to 100 of uh, operations per second. So we are looking at the capacity uh, of the brain as a computer uh, uh, around 1 to 10 peta pentaflops. So it's 10 to the power of 15 uh, elementary operations per second. And um, today's uh, high-performance computers um, they are barely reaching, or maybe they have sur just recently surpassed that, um, that capacity of performing elementary operations per second. Um, so we are talking about, I think, the, rec the world record is around 50 to 55 uh, uh, petaflops uh, on the latest uh, supercomputer. So it's not so much um, an issue of you know, how many operations can be performed. It's also a, a matter of uh, efficiency um, and um, in terms of energy that is um, consumed. And uh, if you look at uh, these high-performance computers and supercomputers, um, like the, the one I was alluding to, uh, I think requires an energy supply in the amount of about one to five megawatts. So it's completely crazy when you compare uh, the efficiency of the brain for the same amount of operations in theory, uh, and at least in terms of capacity for operations, and the human brain can, uh, you know, uh, require basically uh, an energy supply that is equivalent to a light bulb of 10 to 20 watts. So we are looking at things that are tremendously um, uh, different in terms of efficiency, uh, which makes it uh, um, very puzzling for you know computer sh computer scientists to uh, basically try to mimic this uh, extremely powerful object uh, that is able to perform so many uh, elementary operations at once uh, with a very limited uh, uh, supply of energy. So in that respect, it's very fascinating, and it's a, it's one trend of research in the computational modeling uh, of the brain. It's actually trying to use the brain as a model for a computer. So it's like the, the reverse, but very it's two sides of the same coin. Um, whether we're going to learn about brain function by implementing a brain in silico, that's a, a different um, uh, question. I guess maybe yes. But like I said, uh, one of the motivations to develop these neuromorphic uh, computing solutions is to reach a greater efficiency in terms of energy. Um, needs. Uh, then, if uh, these, uh, these solutions exist and are available, and then I guess neuroscientists may use those uh, brainy computers uh, as uh, models uh, that they can basically observe and they can, um, uh, where they can also implement, you know, or test hypotheses about brain function and dysfunction. And you can look at the way uh, you know, the functions of this brain uh, in silico would be altered by modifying some of the parameters and understanding, basically, uh, whether that would lead to be pseudo-behaviors uh, that, are, that are that observed in some patients, for instance. 
And you could also implement some, um, you know, models for brain repair as well. So that makes it very attractive and an alternative to the current, uh, you know, practices in, in biological research, which are relatively limited uh, in terms of testing this kind of hypothesis, because you have to look at animal models, which are very imperfect. Um, uh, and also you have to look at patients, uh, and, but here again, and obviously, the uh, different solutions to treat a given patient are relatively, I would say, limited, because you are dealing with a person and not a computer, so you, you don't want to make mistakes, obviously. Um, so that's one way of doing things, of uh, modeling the brain as a computer. And so there is this hardware portion, but there is also this, uh, the software uh, portion that is uh, also the object of a lot of uh, you know, very active research uh, everywhere. And there is, for instance, the, the Human Brain Project uh, in the European Union that has triggered a lot of interest and which uh, one of the deliverables and objectives is to actually implement a, a, a software version uh, of the brain where this time uh, there is no implementation in silico, but more uh, as, a, as a software program that would basically model every single cell Maybe not in the brain, but uh, in, uh, in some brain regions, for instance, the olfactory system or somatosensory system uh, of a rodent that was published actually last year, for instance. And the approach they are taking is actually to mimic or to implement equations, if you will, for each and every single cell. And the way these different cells interact also is modeled with a, uh, some uh, software modules, and basically you have a supercomputer uh, run this software, and um, you can also do proceed the same way I was describing before by you know observing the end product of this um, brain activity that emerges uh, spontaneously or is altered by a pseudo stimulus that you can also model uh, with software. So this is also very interesting, very flexible, and, um, and also uh, opens great perspective in terms, again, of uh, you know, modeling uh, brain functions and dysfunction. Um, it remains uncertain whether this can scale up to uh, the dimension and complexity of a whole brain, um, and whether we're going to learn about uh, how the brain uh, you know, uh, uh, implements, uh, basically, function and behavior. But uh, this is definitely a, a very active field of research in neuroscience. Uh, and there is also yet another side of this uh, computational aspects that relate to brain function and, um, and brain, uh, brain activity. And this is, uh, you know, the bridge with um, machine learning techniques uh, that have been, you know, exploding over the past uh, five to ten years. And it's very interesting to, uh, to see a little bit of history of how these uh, techniques have developed um, and uh, have gone through a renaissance uh, recently. Because back in the 1970s and early 80s, there were these pioneers in, in computer science and also um, you know, uh, mathematics who've looked at uh, basic models of neural networks and at the mathematical for, uh, formalization of these networks. And um, this research has uh, been, uh, you know, kind of suspended or didn't get too much traction um, in the industry and the rest of the neuroscience community, because basically for these networks to, you know, perform properly in terms of classifying uh, images or um, translating natural language or uh, even the capacity of learning for these networks, it, the, the, they were limited by two factors in. Uh, back in the 80s, 1980s. The first factor was basically um, the limited power of uh, computers, and uh, or if you wanted more computational power, it was really, I mean, it was very difficult to, to access this, um, these resources, uh, which is not the case anymore. And the second aspect was that for training these networks, you had to uh, have a lot of data available to you, like uh, thousands and thousands of images to basically, uh, for the network to be able to classify uh, the different elements in the picture. 
um, a face, uh, an animal, uh, or even you know higher order kind of categories. And this is not the case anymore because data is basically out there, and um, huge databases of um, you know classified um, uh, images, but also sound bites, um, and also um, other other uh, objects of interest are readily available on the internet and um, and have been created over the years. So today uh, we are looking at this revolution of uh, machine learning and um, how it can penetrate basically the industry and uh, and um, you know consumer goods. And um, but the question is, okay, is it really? Um, um, uh, a translational aspect of neuroscience, or are we going to learn about how the brain works with machine learning? As of today, I don't think that's the case. I think uh, in that respect, um, I mean, the implementation of machine learning is is very remarkable and is is full of promises, but also poses some uh, uh, soci societal and ethical challenges. But um, if you look at just the scientific portion of it, you would hope that by observing these neural networks uh, in action, uh, by performing classification you know, on series of images or translating natural language, you would learn how the brain does that. Um, and that's not the case because uh, it's, although uh, the architecture of the software mimics that of the brain networks, Yet the mechanisms by how these uh, software bytes, you know, bits um, realize this function uh, is not clear. Meaning that you, it's very hard to generalize and to understand the mechanisms of that have been implemented by the network uh, to perform uh, uh, even with very high performance uh, a given task. So in that respect, you don't have the insight of you know, um, looking at uh, the implementation of a given function, and therefore you cannot bridge uh, that with um, uh, the, uh, the actual uh, brain activity that may be observed uh, in humans. So, but taken together, I mean, with the um, emergence of uh, new mathematical tools, but also you know, the, um, the, uh, the immediate access to huge uh, amounts of data, and also computer resources. I mean, all the elements are, are in place to basically um, approach this fascinating question of, you know, a better understanding of uh, brain activity, brain function, brain dysfunction, uh, with basically new methods and new resources that we didn't have even uh, recently. So I am a mammal. You are a mammal. Everybody here in this room is a mammal and possibly many people, if they are watching with you, are mammals. I'm very happy to be a mammal. Who wants to be a toad or a fish or a worm? We mammals are very successful animals. We mammals captured the whole globe. Wherever you go on this earth, you will see mammals. You will see them in the Arctic, you will see, in the, see them in the jungle, in the woods, and in the water. And wherever we mammals are, we are very successful. Why are we so successful? The reason is possibly very simple. We mammals are very smart animals. And this, the intelligence of us mammals is a function of our brain. And the mammalian brain is a very different one from the brains of birds, from frogs, from reptiles, and from fish. As you possibly know, only we mammals have a cortex. The cortex, and I would like to draw this to you, is a fantastic structure of our brain. You possibly know, I will show you this picture now, that if you look at a mammalian brain, this is, for example, the brain of a human person. And if you take a little bit, bit out of this part of the cortex, what you can see here is that this, part, that this cortex is divided in different layers, six layers altogether, and that there are 
different neurons specialized to different jobs in the cortex. And no other vertebrate has such a brain. The cortex is a fantastic machine because of one architectural feature. Look, I need now another color. I take red. All information comes in vertically. And every red line is one specific information that comes into the cortex. Vertically arranged so that each ner nerve cell along that red line receives the same kind of information. But each cell processes this information in a different way. So that when you see a specific color, a specific sound, a specific touch on your skin, it is analyzed in all details along the vertical dimension. And now comes the following point. All of this information is then exchanged horizontally with all of the other areas of the brain. This part of the brain talks to that part of the brain, to that part, to that part, to that part, and so on. You have a vertical arrangement with detailed analysis and a horizontal exchange of information. This is the machine of thinking. I have it, you have it. And this is the reason why we mammals are so smart. This is a theory that emerged about 100 years ago. And since 100 years, we believe that this is true. And I will tell you now that this is wrong. Why is this wrong? Because this theory has a certain implication. The implication is an animal without such a cortex should not be able to be smart because this is the only arrangement that makes animals smart. This is position one of this old theory. But there is a second position. Brains have to have a cortex and they have to be large. Our brain is about 1.3 kilogram. It's a big brain. Most other animals, for example birds, have very small brains of 5 gram, 2 gram, 10 gram. And they have no cortex. So birds, for example, should not be able to be so intelligent. And now comes a new chapter. We have a problem. Birds are so smart as we mammals. Take, for example, crows and ravens. For example, ravens can plan into the future as good as chimpanzees do. They can combine information logically as good as chimpanzees do. Let's take another task. Are you able to inhibit your motives immediately? What do I mean with that? For example, let's take two different kinds of foods. This is one that I like, and this is one for which I'm crazy. I would like to eat that. I like that, but not as much as this one. Now I give the animal, a raven for example, this. And the animal has learned that it has to look at that without eating it. And then it looks and looks and looks and it is not allowed to eat it. How long will the animal be able to just stop its eating? Ravens can do that for about 10 minutes. When they wait 10 minutes, they get the good food and they eat the good food. Chimpanzees can do that for four minutes only. Gray parrots 
can do that for 15 minutes. Our children cannot do that for 15 minutes. So all aspects that we call cognition are equal between birds and mammals. And if you take the top birds, parrots and corvids, you can see that they are as intelligent as primates. And now we are back to the brain problem. A raven has 15 gram of brain. 15 gram of brain. Usually even less, about 12. A chimpanzee's, a chimpanzee has 400 gram of brain. So 12 gram versus 400 gram. In these 12 gram, the raven is doing the same as the chimpanzee with 400 gram. The chimpanzee has this kind of cortex. So what is the brain of the raven? I'll tell you. I draw you now a raven brain. It looks a bit like that. If we take out a little part of it, this is the raven brain, I will take out a part of it, I will magnify it here. What do we see here? No lamination. Disorganized cells. So here we have a small brain that is not organized. Here we have a large brain that is beautifully organized. How is this possible that this is the better design than our brain? You possibly want to have an answer to this. I have to tell you that I'm only giving you half an answer because I don't know the second half of it. But at least we learned a little bit of this mystery in the last years. I'll tell you. First, it seems that in the evolution of vertebrate brains, of bird brains and mammalian brains, both groups, mammals and birds, started I will show you here, with a primitive cortex with just three layers. We mammals doubled the numbers of layers. What birds did they gave up the layers. So we doubled the numbers of layers. They gave it up. Why did they give it up? Now comes the second point. Their brain is much denser packed with neurons than our brain. They have about four times more neurons per volume space. That means if you take, now I do this in red to be pedagogically able. If you take a certain part of the brain out and you take the same part of the brain here, the same volume you have, excuse me for this, This is the picture. You have more neurons here than there. Depending on where you look, the difference can be large, four times. Sometimes it can be very small, like double. But in any way, it's more densely packed here than there. So 
Birds have small brains, but they have brains with much more neurons than we expect it to be. Second implication of this, these neurons are very close to each other. These neurons are far away from each other. So these neurons can communicate faster with each other because they are very close by. These are possibly some of the reasons why birds have such superior abilities. Abilities that we did not expect from these birds. But the bottom line is the following. There must be more what makes them so smart. And the majority of this answer I cannot give you yet. The only thing is that we have two implications. First, the next time that you look out of your window and you see a crow, say, hello, feathered, feathered chimpanzee. It's a chimpanzee with feathers. Isn't that beautiful? And it visits you. It's out in, in the trees of, of Russia. It's beautiful. Second, per neuron, birds are able to come up with more intelligence than we are able to do. So they have the better design, we don't. But then you can ask the critical question, why are we humans ruling the world? Why do we shoot crows and they don't shoot us? The reason is possibly the following. We have really huge brains. So we might have not the best design, but we compensate the lack of the best design by sheer size, just by number crunching power of a huge brain. This is how we got so smart to capture the world. And now imagine another evolution where birds would have developed large brains. And now think back that birds are the surviving dinosaurs. The dinosaur with the largest brain was T-Rex. It had 110 gram of brain. Maybe T-Rex was not so dumb as we usually think. So as a psychologist, we have many different techniques that we can use. And certainly when we're dealing with patients, say with depression, we frequently use techniques like cognitive behavioral therapy. But what we're beginning to realize more and more is that many of these people with neuropsychiatric disorders and brain injury actually have cognitive problems. So what's being used by psychologists quite frequently now is what we call cognitive training. And that's a way that we can boost cognition and we don't use drugs to do this. We just do it through the method of getting people to exercise their brain using a, a, a fixed technique, usually on a computer the cognitive training is delivered. But what we also found is that healthy people can benefit from this kind of cognitive training. So there's work by Torko Klingberg at the Karolinska Institute, where he showed that um, doing uh, cognitive training of working memory in healthy people over quite an extended period of time will actually lead to changes in activations in the brain, but will also lead to changes in D1 receptors in the brain. So this is really interesting, how you can actually modify uh, these circuits in the brain. And some years ago, with my colleague Martin Oral, we wrote a paper for the British Medical Journal called Use It or Lose It. And it was really all about the fact that we have to work areas of the brain if we want to keep them active. So in the way that people do crossword puzzles or Sudoku or other, other ways to sort of, or go on lifelong learning courses to really uh, stimulate their brain, this is a very important thing to do. And we really need to do this uh, lifelong. So we all, we know that cognitive training works. So people like Till Weichs at the Institute of Psychiatry 
have actually done meta-analysis, looking at the effects of cognitive training, along with other forms of rehabilitation, on patients with schizophrenia. And she's been able to show that this training has a moderate effect size on cognition, but also has a moderate effect size on psychosocial functioning. So by doing this, not only do the patients get the benefit of an improved cognition, but this has a knock-on effect on their functionality in every day and that their psychosocial functioning improves. So the trouble with cognitive training is that usually you have to come into a hospital setting to do this and frequently you have to have specialized uh, staff to help you go through the programs and things like this. So this can be expensive and it can be inconvenient. In my laboratory, we thought, well, let's, how can we modify this cognitive training in order to make it fun, enjoyable, and easy to access? So what we decided to do was essentially what we call gamify the cognitive training. So in my lab, we got a uh, games developer to come and work with us, and we used the st studies that we had over 20 years to look at the uh, neuropsychological benefits neuroimaging benefits of actually doing these tasks and the areas of the brain that they activated. And one of the tasks that we particularly were interested in was episodic memory. And that is the type of memory that we use every day. We know that episodic memory is related to functionality in schizophrenia and also in Alzheimer's disease. So we know that if we could boost uh, episodic memory, we would probably boost functional outcome. And so what we did was we used a, a wizard motif, a kind of, uh, everybody knows about Harry Potter and the, everybody's interested in it. And it seemed that that would be something really engaging for these patients, uh, people with schizophrenia, who we were trying to boost their memory for. So we worked with that kind of a theme. We utilized the data that we had showing how we could activate that area of the brain. We'd already done, published a paper in Neuropsychologia showing that it, when people were lying in a scanner, we, we looked at elderly people and people with mild cognitive impairment, when they were lying in a scanner doing a paired associate learning test, an episodic learning test, we got this nice activation in the hippocampal area. So we knew that was a way to stimulate and activate that area of the brain. So we essentially put that into a game, and then we actually went out and piloted it on people with schizophrenia to make sure that they found it interesting, enjoyable, they got it. And so this is a motivating way to improve uh, people's cognitive function. So it's essentially the cognitive training that psychologists accept as being very beneficial, but it's put into a game. And there are games companies now, where they call themselves sort of serious games companies, where they're trying to work to improve people's cognitive function through these means, and healthy people too. So it's a good thing for us to do, because everybody likes to play games, so we might as well play games that are good for us. But of course, not all games are good for us. Um, these games that we, I'm talking about have been developed with an evidence base behind them. So it's very important that there is evidence, scientific evidence, showing that these games actually work and are successful. So in this game, the way that we decided to do it was it's, it's very much based on a, a kind of episodic memory theme. So you, you can uh, fight with wizards and things like that. But basically what you have to do, what the hippocampus in the brain does is remember the location of objects in space. So this game is very much based on that. And what happens is you, as you remember things, you get rewarded with spells that you can then fight against other wizards with. And so it's a very engaging type of thing. And the nice thing is the game is adjusted in, in, to help with your motivation so that if you're doing well, it pushes you on and you get more challenge for the game and you, you, you can gain more things and then cast more spells and fight other wizards and move along the trajectory. If you're having difficulty, it brings you back down again. So it's nicely tri titrated in the way that, you know, games, games people do to make sure that you're learning and remembering as much as you can. And it keeps giving you more and more levels of difficulty. And you keep encountering different situations with wizards who are trying to attack you and you're trying to attack them and you spells. And then you, uh, you know, are successful and you get lots of rewards for doing that.
So what we found was that if we ask uh, schizophrenic patients to train on this um, test for eight hours over one month, not only does their episodic memory improve, but we also got uh, improvements in their activities of daily living. So the, when we looked at their global uh, functioning through the GAF test, we found that they also improved on that. So it wasn't just limited to their episodic memory. They also got improvements in their psychosocial functioning with the test. So when we asked uh, people with schizophrenia to play the game for eight hours over one month, we found that not only did they get gains in their episodic memory, so their memory did improve, but we also found that their psychosocial functioning improved. So the game really had benefits that weren't just restricted to the memory, but also to their psychosocial functioning and everyday activities. So what we find is that obviously nowadays people are so interested in their physical health and they monitor their physical health. Frequently they have Fitbits to measure their steps or their, their running or whatever and in, the, in their phones they measure their sleep or their steps or whatever. So people are very keen to measure their physical health. But what we're finding is that unfortunately, as yet, we're not using this new technology enough to improve our cognition, our, our brain health. So it, it will be good when we have more apps on phones where people can monitor their cognition and if they notice a change in it, they can start to improve it and that will be very beneficial. And they can also use games on apps, on phones or iPads to uh, improve their cognitive function and hopefully their mental well-being as well. People are going to play games, so they should play games that are good for their uh, brain health and also that are motivating, maybe improve their positive outlook on life because we can adjust the way that we see the world. That's what cognitive behavioral treatments are all about. But you need to use games where there is an evidence base to them because some games uh, really adjust don't really have the same effects. There's no neuropsychological or neuroimaging evidence to show that they are having the effects on behavior and on, on perhaps on the brain. These games that are based on uh, a long history of data do have. So one way that we can use games is both for people with neuropsychiatric disorders and brain injury. So for instance, if we're currently working with people with mild cognitive impairment, this is the early stage of Alzheimer's disease. And we're working with a specific group which is called amnestic mild cognitive impairment. And the uh, progression to Alzheimer's disease is now recognized. So the point is that if you can activate those areas of the brain that are first affected in Alzheimer's disease, such as the hippocampal formation, you may find that you can keep those areas functioning better for longer and it will delay the onset or the worst outcomes of some of these disorders. We also know that in healthy people, there is a deterioration in your cognition over time. So we function at our highest level in our 20s and then, and then there's a slight decline. And of course, as healthy people, we have lots of um, ways that we can uh, use strategies and it's called you know, experience to use strategies to overcome some of our, you know, perhaps we uh, don't, our memory's not quite as good as it used to be. But there may be these, these games may be a great way to actually activate these areas of the brain. And not just in the area of memory, but we can also think about attention because attention is so important. Frequently we need sustained attention to do really well, you know, concentration to do really well on a task because it requires that we have to focus on that and get the, the most out of it. But now we find that lots of people, because we multitask and because we're uh, looking at our phones, looking at our computers, people are ringing us up and different things are happening, that we find it hard to maintain our focus of attention or concentration for long periods of time, which may be necessary for certain jobs. And the benefits to, to this may also be for other groups. So we can think of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, where there are problems in, in sustained attention and concentration. They, they have trouble sticking and focusing on one thing. Uh, and for this reason, they're frequently giving medications when they're in the um, more moderate to severe end of the spectrum. So for mild ADHD, you can just treat this with 
psychological treatments such as CBT or more directed um, psychological treatments for ADHD. But when it gets to be more moderate and severe, frequently drug treatments are used like methylphenidate Ritalin, which affects dopamine and noradrenaline in the brain. But we may be able to, especially in children, it would be nice if we could reduce the need for these drugs or maybe reduce the dose that people have and the, the um, frequency which, which, with which they're dosed if we could also um, cognitively train them to be able to focus their attention and, and perform better. So it may be that sometimes we will have combination of treatments which may be the most effective to get the best outcomes for people with ADHD and other disorders. I would, just, I would like to say a few words about brain basis of language. We know from patients, from neurological studies, that some parts of the brain are particularly important for language. Actually, the, the whole brain, the whole uh, new part of the brain, the, the, the neocortex, which is especially large in humans, is important for language. However, there are specific parts of that big structure the, 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 the neocortex, which are of particular relevance for language. And one of them is in the frontal cortex. Another one, a second one, is in the temporal uh, cortex, so behind the left ear. It's usually the left hemisphere, which is most important for language, in most of us at least. And uh, we know from case descriptions, neurologists in the 19th century already described uh, diseases that uh, involved the frontal language center, uh, which, uh, which were accompanied by a problem in speaking and also some difficulty understanding. And then the, 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 the other one behind the ear, the temporal lobe lesion, also produced a problem in speaking and understanding. And, uh, and those uh, diseases uh, were called then aphasias. aphasias language disorders after acquired brain injury in adults. So from, from, these, from these patients we know which parts of the brain have the, take the heaviest, the, the, uh, the, the, the most uh, burden, in, uh, mo or take most of the burden in language processing, so to speak. Now, why is that? We have models today that, uh, that would actually account for that, in, uh, uh, at least in part. We know that our brain has certain neuroanatomical structure. We know that our articulators, uh, the mouth, are, are controlled by a region, the so-called motor cortex, articulatory motor cortex, which is very close to this, to, to this frontal language region. And we know that that the cables from our ears that tell the brain about acoustic signals we process, they reach uh, areas in the temporal cortex which are very close to those regions that would, uh, that would also be of particular relevance for language. So why then would these language regions uh, 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 take their home close to these inputs and outputs of language? Well, the explanation is, uh, can be provided by neurobiological models where we, where we put in, uh, where we uh, produce neural networks, so artificial brain-like structures where we, uh, where we have a motor cortex and then this frontal language uh, region and the, and the auditory cortex, the sound processing areas and also the uh, areas around those. And then we present this network with information uh, we, would, uh, we would actually p uh, produce and uh, receive during language acquisition, during early stages of language learning. If I play a baby or an early language learner, I may first say syllables like sy sy senseless syllables such as ba ba ba, or later on single words like bat or car. And those, uh, and, and those would of course be required in order to move my mouth would require that some, that, that some motor activation takes place and also at the same time there's activation 
in the auditory system because I hear myself speaking and therefore we have at two very distant uh, ends of the brain, if you wish, in the motor cortex, in the, in, the, in the auditory cortex, in the front, in the back, we have correlated activation. And now I mentioned, I mentioned the term of correlation and correlation is something, uh, correlation is something very important because our brain is particularly good at mapping correlations. It has learning rules that drive the strength between nerve cells according to the correlation of their firing. So if we have this correlation at different ends of our brain when we speak, there, is, there will be strengthening of the links between these, uh, between these nerve cells and because there are actually no strong connections between the motor cortex and the auditory cortex proper, the activation needs to take detours around, uh, take regions in other parts of the frontal cortex, close by parts of the temporal cortex and those now happen to be linked with each other. And that's a particular important, particularly important feature of the human brain because only very recently it has been uh, discovered that especially in the left hemisphere there are fundamentally strong connections between, the, be, between this frontal uh, language area and this temporal language area that, uh, that, that lead information back and forth between the two. So, for mapping the correlation between motor and auditory uh, uh, neural activation, our, uh, our brain, our human brain, is especially good, well developed, cut out for, if you wish. So, so the, the idea here uh, I, I'm trying to uh, bring forward here is that during, uh, during our early language acquisition, when learning the first words, we would build neuronal assemblies, circuits of strongly connected nerve cells, one for every word and maybe larger construction and, uh, and, and thereby we, uh, we built a vocabulary of words and longer, and, and longer junks of language, which then become, uh, become uh, um, consolidated over time and, and, and form the building blocks of language. And now back to our aphasia data, our, our brain lesion data. Now we can use this type of model and, uh, and, and, and lesion it in the front and lesion it in the back and then find that our artificial neural networks do something very similar to what patients with the frontal and the temporal uh, lesion uh, do what, what, or what they, uh, the, they show deficits as our, patient, as our patients do. They have problems mainly in speaking when we lesion in the front, but there's also a detectable uh, problem in understanding language and even single words if the lesion is in the front. But, uh, and of course, if, if, if the back part, the temporal cortex gets, uh, receives a lesion, there's a heavy language understanding problem. Uh, but also some difficulty finding the right words and uh, composing the words in the correct way from their individual language sounds, phonemes. So we are uh, we are here in the process of slowly but steadily improving our understanding of uh, brain language relationships. I have now only talked about words, and this is of course very uh, very simple topic relative to to the uh, complex syntax and then the, uh, the meaning of words and, uh, and, and larger constructions and finally the, uh, the, the whole the social interactions in which language plays a big role. But however, these biological mechanisms kick in already very early and at a, at a very basic level and at this higher level, more complex levels, we have similar situations. So, so the language machinery can slowly but steadily be explained a little better now using neurocomputational work and of course looking at the patients in, the de in much detail and, uh, and, and of course a topic uh, which we could uh, elaborate on too um, 
with uh, when we use neuroimaging and uh, and and modern techniques to stimulate parts of the brain. So one possibility is to look at patients with language disturbances and describe their problems. They may have problems naming objects, say this is a glass, uh, or um, or they may have understanding problems. So if you if you show them the glass and, uh, and 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 maybe a hand, and you ask which is the hand, they may point at the wrong and uh, at the wrong object. So these patient studies um, are one important part. Uh, then we do neuroimaging. We use fMRI, EEG, MEG, magnetoencephalography, and look at the brain activation patterns elicited by speech sounds, by words, by little constructions, by complex sentences, or by whole interactions between communication partners. When I ask somebody to, to give me something and, and, uh, and, and, and he or she responds, there, there are specific brain activation patterns we can map. Uh, and a different uh, strategy is, of course, to, do, uh, to, to, to play patients with healthy people. There are methods to slightly affect the functionality of the brain by magnetic stimulation. So, and, and by that we can produce mini lesions or mini activations very focally, uh, much more focal than the usually big brain lesions. And then we can address the question, is a smaller part of the brain causally involved in, uh, in uh, language understanding, just to take one example. In 2015, we published a paper where we showed that stimulating the motor cortex in the frontal lobe uh, influences the understanding of single words. So some colleagues believe that the frontal cortex and especially the motor system is not so important for understanding. Certainly it's not so important as other parts of the brain, as the, 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 the temporal language region. However, it also plays a role in understanding and even at the single word level. We, we now know a little bit more, just a little bit more, about brain language relationships and we can even address the question why the language regions are placed in the brain where they are and, uh, and we can use neural network simulations mimicking the brain, artificial brain so to speak, uh, to provide explanations why certain aphasias, language disturbances occur after specific lesions. Brain imaging is the measurement of brain responses, responses to changes in stimuli, changes in mood. Um, in fact, anything you think of that the brain can do, then you can challenge the brain experimentally and then measure how the brain responds, responds to those challenges. The imaging bit uh, comes from the fact that the brain has a particular architecture, a particular anatomy. So certain parts of the brain are specialized for uh, performing certain functions. So for example, there's a particular part of my brain, largely about here, that's specifically engaged by uh, visual motion. So watching moving things and analyzing and processing that information to try and infer or work out the causes of those visual uh, visual sensations. To know that you have to be able to measure the whole brain and establish which parts of those brains respond selectively to the particular attribute or the particular function that you're interested in. So that requires a measurement of brain responses and that's essentially what we do here at the Wellcome Trust Centre for Neuroimaging at University College London. There are a number of different ways that one can measure brain responses. They can roughly fall into two um, classes. The first are um, measurements that depend upon the brain's energy supply and blood supply. So clearly if you're using your brain to process sensory information, say visual information, that requires energy, it requires work, and in fact the brain um, accounts for a considerable proportion of the body's energy budget and that work is localised. 
So there's an increase, a blushing, if you like, of different parts of the brain in response to processing that sort of information. For example, visual motion. That can be measured if you can assess the local blood flow or the consequences of that non-invasively, by which I mean measuring from outside the skull. Um, and while a lot of the work that we do uh, here at the uh, Wellcome Trust Centre is to measure the blood flow or the hemodynamic responses in terms of subtle changes in magnetic fields or the signals produced by the differences in the, uh, 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 the magnetic behaviour of blood before and after it has given up its oxygen to the nervous tissue so that it can do the processing, do the neuronal firing. So that means if we can scan a brain within say one or two seconds in one condition and then scan again in the, second, uh, in the next little um, portion of time, um, we can get a picture of fluctuations in blood flow or in the energy uh, consumption at each point in the brain. And then by looking at the patterns of fluctuations in the blood flow responses and the patterns of stimulation that we provide to our subjects or possibly patients, uh, then we can see whether, the, which that, whether that part of the brain is engaged by the particular stimuli. So I could present to you uh, for several seconds a, uh, a, a picture, a still picture of say dots. And then I could suddenly make the dots move. And I can measure your brain activity in terms of its metabolic activity during the period of static viewing and the equivalent activity during the, mo the, uh, the processing of the moving dots. And then by comparing the patterns of activity throughout the brain, basically by subtracting the stationary condition from the moving dot condition, I can isolate those parts of the brain that were more active during the moving dots paradigm. And then I can infer that that part of the brain was specialised for processing visual motion. That notion and that basic paradigm can be generalised to any sensory, motor, cognitive, emotional processing or situation that you can imagine. Um, so we can um, look at the correlates, the hemodynamic correlates, the blood flow correlates of working memory, of processing various uh, emotional stimuli like fa fearful faces. Uh, we can look at the, um, the correlates of being in different brain states, for example, being depressed or not being depressed or being elated and not being, being elated, anxious. And in this way, one can build up literally a map. And very often people have described much of early brain imaging as a cartography, a, a map building exercise that allows you to assign various functions to functionally specialized parts of the brain, thereby creating a, uh, literally an atlas or a map of which parts of the brain do what and ultimately how different parts of the brain talk to each other. So you're building a picture of functional anatomy, an anatomy of function of processing information, uh, I repeat, from right from the sensory processing right through to the cognitive operations such as attention and memory to get a holistic and global picture of how the brain works. Now, I said at the beginning, there are these brain imaging technologies come in two flavours. So I've been talking about um, techniques that rest upon um, functional magnetic resonance imaging or positron emission tomography. So these are literally um, devices that provide or offer you an image, a snapshot of brain activity at one point in time, usually over several seconds. Um, so what, we're not, what we are looking at are not the actual very fast fluctuations in electromagnetic activity that nerve cells engage in, uh, all the fast synaptic processes that mediate neural processing, but the energy supply uh, 
that is necessary to sustain that level of information processing or message passing. And the fluctuations in that energy supply are in the order of four to five seconds. So we're looking at fluctuations over quite extended periods of time. We can do that with exquisite spatial precision. So we can, you know, the, um, the little elements that constitute the entire brain imaging can be as small as a few millimetres. So we can measure almost down to the resolution of a few millimetres the specific responses to various experimental paradigms. But clearly, there's very little temporal acuity, there's very little temporal precision in these sorts of measurements because the way that your brain works uh, is on a time scale that's measured in milliseconds. You notice things, you, you, you think and you move on a time scale uh, where things happen several times a second, if not several times you know, uh, every few hundred milliseconds. So now we turn to the other sort of brain imaging, which is the, uh, the measurement of the actual electrical and magnetic signals generated by the nervous activity, the nerve cell activity itself. And these fluctuate very, very quickly. Um, so if I were to present to you a single dot visually, and I left it uh, on the screen for, say, 50 milliseconds, that would create a barrage of nervous impulses that would propagate from your eyes through various uh, subcortical structures to the back of the brain and then bounce forward and go everywhere each part of the brain taking from it, or um, some people would say trying to predict uh, the causes of that sensory information that I've provided to you. And in doing that, what you see are fast fluctuations in the electromagnetic field that can be picked up by sensors that are placed either on the scalp or if they're magnetic sensors uh, slightly distant from the scalp to get a picture from very different points of view of these fast fluctuations, ripples in electromagnetic activity that are different at every point in the brain. So this would be electromagnetic brain imaging. It would be um, uh, the sort of imaging um, that you will associate with uh, um, uh, EEG or um, magnetoencephalography or electroencephalography that measures respectively the magnetic and the electrical consequences of this nervous uh, activity, this, uh, this um, neuronal firing induced by experimental design. That's a form of brain imaging which has exquisite temporal precision, but you can see immediately that looking from the outside in at a very complicated spatial arrangement of coupled neuronal responses playing out on a time scale of a few hundred milliseconds is a very difficult picture to interpret unless you can go in and assign your measurements to various parts of the brain. That's a very difficult problem. It's called the, uh, the, uh, an inverse problem, basically trying to reconstruct the pattern of electromagnetic activity across the brain that best explains your sensory measurements from these sensors placed on the outside of the brain. However, that can be done uh, with some, some assumptions. So you can build or reconstruct a picture of distributed neuronal activity on almost a millisecond by millisecond timescale that allows you then to interrogate and understand not the spatial deployment of uh, neuronal responses, but their temporal anatomy, the succession of uh, responses um, in terms of which areas pass information to other areas and then other areas pass information back, creating a succession of little waves. And sometimes in continuously processing um, information, these waves constitute oscillations, so there's a whole field of reconstructing, creating images of the brain in action in an ongoing way. Uh, by characterizing the neuronal activity that you've induced by asking subjects, say, to, to move uh, coherently moving visual stimuli or dots uh, in terms of the frequencies with which you're engaging the neural activity. And there are all sorts of interesting questions about the physiology and the anatomy of that message passing that can be addressed at this fine timescale. So in conclusion, 
brain imaging is in the game of acquiring measurements that inform our understanding of how the brain passes messages um, of a neuronal sort from one part of the brain to the other in order to make sense of the world. And we've got two ways of doing that. We can either look at the spatial deployment of the energetics that are induced by neuronal processing using technologies like magnetic resonance imaging or positron emission tomography, or we can get into the detailed temporal structure by looking, looking at electromagnetic uh, responses using sensors that are external to the brain. We now have a convergence of several technologies that are making it possible to understand how the brain works. And this includes uh, you know, a variety of techniques uh, like uh, electroencephalography, magnetoencephalography, uh, near infrared Im functional near infrared imaging, uh, functional magneto resistance imaging, uh, and so on. The challenges that w many people uh, like myself are trying to address are how do we decode uh, the information that we get about brain activity uh, from physical sensors that we're developing. So what we have recently done is to develop sensors that will measure um, electric fields around the brain and we're also developing techniques to do this uh, to, to do this with high precision. So the brain actually emits electromagnetic signals and you can detect brain activity using electrical measurements like in electrical electroencephalography. You can also detect magnetic fields of the brain in a technique called magnetoencephalography. With techniques like ours, which are becoming more precise, uh, what they can do is they can uh, lead to more precise information on the nature and type of activity uh, in the brain. So the systems that we're trying to build uh, are very high density measurements around the scalp and then we're combining them with uh, a uh, host of software tools to try to reconstruct brain activity. For instance, we have recently shown uh, using some new sensors that we developed uh, that we can uh, uh, achieve classification accuracies of almost 90 percent uh, using our system. So the idea is that you know a subject is shown different uh, images, uh, it, it could be words and then there are some um, uh, spurious words that are inserted and these then and the question is can the uh, person uh, identify these or what are the processes that occur when that happens. This type of classification system, uh, if we could completely decode it, could lead uh, to better uh, applications, for instance, in brain computer interfaces, where if we can actually decode the responses and the thinking of the person, then uh, to, to particular stimuli, uh, then we can then uh, create systems which will actually interact with the person uh, to achieve you know, whatever outcomes uh, that are necessary or that are desired. Uh, we are interested in a variety of problems using our sensors uh, in collaboration with uh, a large number of uh, other uh, neuroscientists and neurologists. For instance, in epilepsy, the type of precision functional brain imaging system that we are uh, building will uh, lead to 
much better localization of the source of epileptic seizures. Also of potentially of epileptic pathways, seizure pathways. Now these are all very important for say the clinician uh, because you know when they try to um, when they do brain surgery to they typically you know cut out parts parts of the brain in order to reduce the seizures and naturally the, you want to do it as precisely as you can so you need to know as precisely as you can the source of electrical activity the technologies that are emerging today uh, are also will lead to new and better monitoring of for instance seizures for patients even um, silent uh, seizures uh, and uh, and things like that so that that will uh, improve the quality of life of these patients also there are other applications that we're looking at for instance how do you uh, understand how people respond to visual stimuli of various kinds can you do pattern recognition and for instance when you're looking at scenes when there is a um, uh, an event that is occurring uh, do people rec how do people recognize that and this is all manifest it mas manifesting itself through brain activity the key point of what we're trying to do is of course that it is non-invasive uh, and has is very quick uh, ha, can do it on fast time scales compared for instance to functional MRI uh, which has great precision but is very slow and we're trying to do it in a portable manner which is very important because you know you want it uh, you don't want it to be limited to simply uh, clinical settings you want it to be ambulatory so that it gives, you can integrate it into a person's day-to-day -day activities. Some things that are going to be feasible today uh, in the very near future are, will be quite amazing. You know, we will be in fact, we can even communicate with our thoughts through the use of technology. Uh, already there has been a recent demonstration of two rats who have been who have communicated with each other through sensors the same thing is certainly feasible uh, with humans and I think I mean there, one can see a future where in fact our minds will be connected uh, through the cloud the the computer the, the uh, data cloud because these sensors will talk to the iPhones and then they will then talk to the cloud which can then of course communicate with whoever you wish it. it they could send a signal, uh, a warning to the neurologist who is looking out for a patient. It could go into you know, devices to control them. These are all going to be feasible uh, in the very near future. The biggest challenge that we face here is in trying to decode what is significant activity compared with what is noise. Here is really where uh, we, where the, it'll take a lot of research, but this can be done through sort of careful design of experiments and trying to decode. Uh, in our case, we're looking at electrical activity. Uh, and so how do you, you know, hone in on s specific uh, activity related to specific functions? This is the major challenge that uh, we're all uh, facing in this field. Uh, and I think as the measurements improve, as the studies are better designed, we will have better and better understanding of this. So what is what we do is to record many hundreds of signals and then analyze them 
and then correlate them to particular uh, activities or brain states. Uh, well, some well there are some well known parameters, uh, you know, like alpha, beta, gamma waves, which are typically which are associated with various functions that they can increase. For instance, uh, uh, drowsiness can increase uh, alpha waves, for instance. Any even concentration can affect these patterns and they can enhance one component or the other. So looking at the spectral patterns of the signals, you can identify, uh, you can correlate it to specific activities and uh, you can correlate visual stimuli to certain patterns. Um, you can co correlate tactile or touch to certain patterns. So all of these have signatures in the electrical activity, uh, which you can then try to, to decode uh, and relate to what the stimulus is. There are many improvements that we can see. For instance, I think we, we will have much better and clearer maps of brain activity, which will be achieved uh, through a variety of uh, approaches, not just through electrical activity as we're doing, but also we're using nanotechnologies and nanomaterials to probe uh, brain processes, uh, it, using them as contrast agents and uh, coupled with other measurements like MRI. We will get better and better definition from a variety of these uh, methods on brain imaging and brain activity. When we think of invasive in, the, in regard to the brain, typically are talk, thinking of opening the skull and implanting electrodes, uh, which is a very invasive process. The other way is to inject uh, materials, which can then be coupled with appropriate activities. Uh, you know, which can uh, specific, which can lead to specific signals, uh, which can then be detected to trump something like uh, magnetic MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. That is not nearly as invasive as the, you know, direct surgical insertion of electrodes. But all of these are are occurring. Today we are at an unprecedented moment in understanding brain activity and over the next decade or so our understanding of how the brain works, how it responds to various uh, stimuli, even how we think, how our emotions express themselves, these will all will get a better and better understanding and this is really a, a unique moment which has occurred through not just a single technology, but a whole multitude of technologies that have converged and lead to this really unique moment. So, um, yes, so clinical brain imaging is, uh, is essentially um, a domain uh, of uh, radiology that has developed um, tremendously over the past uh, decades. Um, and the beauty of it, it's um, like in most aspects of uh, biomedical imaging, is that it uh, resorts to uh, you know, fundamental principles of physics. Uh, and people often ask what are fundamental science uh, topics uh, good for and developments good for. And sometimes it's just for the beauty of science, but um, medical imaging uh, is definitely one beautiful example where there's a, a fundamental or um, a very strong translational aspect from basic science to uh, things that are truly useful uh, in, everyday, in everyday life or in people's lives, especially for clinical uh, and therapeutic aspects. So um, if you look at all the available techniques uh, today uh, for brain imaging in particular, um, again, they are all based on these fundamental principles of, of physics um, related to uh, nuclear um, or atomic energy, atomic uh, uh, physics, uh, 
but also X-rays, um, electromagnetics, this kind of aspects. So in a nutshell, um, there might be a, a handful of techniques that are present in most uh, you know, um, hospitals, uh, starting with the, uh, uh, the principles of X-ray propagation uh, and transmission through different tissues uh, of the body and of the head in particular, through the, through the brain and through the skull. So the most popular by far is certainly CT scanning and CT stands for computerized tomography, where basically X-rays are uh, sent by a source through the, through the brain and through the head, and the attenuation and scattering of the X-rays is uh, analyzed with um, a computer, hence uh, you know, the CT acronym for, for the technique. And uh, the, the principle is actually, um, again, relatively simple, and the outcome of the, uh, uh, the test is um, uh, to basically localize and assess whether someone has suffered from a traumatic brain injury, maybe a stroke. Uh, and so the technique is very good at looking and localizing and um, identifying you know, major uh, insults to the brain, uh, but with a relatively poor specificity in terms of where anatomically um, the, um, the, the lesion, for instance, is located with respect to what structure. It's relatively easy, of course, and straightforward to you know, identify whether it's more on the right side or the left side, obviously, uh, of the brain, whether it's more frontal or posterior. But with respect to the you know, very fine anatomy of the brain, the convolutions, the folds, etc., uh, it's not as good as uh, the most recent techniques. But relatively speaking, uh, it's still very popular for two reasons. The cost is relatively reasonable, so to speak. Uh, and also, very importantly for hospitals, the, um, the, the duration of the, uh, of the test is uh, relatively short, usually a few minutes for a whole brain um, evaluation, if you will. And that's very important, obviously, in a situation of emergency uh, to the patient but also for you know, the high throughput of uh, you know, um, testing uh, a high volume of patients uh, in a radiology department. So still today for um, you know, clinical purposes, CT scans are the, by far the most used uh, uh, tests in, in the radiology and neuroradiology department. For research though, it's not, except the very research based on the development of the instrumentation, to the next uh, you know, frontier, uh, and maybe some aspects of data analysis and image, uh, image analysis. This is not so much um, a tool for research in neuroscience, for instance, but uh, uh, we are talking here about clinical imaging. So what has uh, taken over, not so much the, um, in terms of volume, but in terms of specific uh, questions that the medical doctors can ask about their patients, uh, so what has taken over um, over the past 15 years or 20 years now is um, magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. And uh, again, it's beautiful physics uh, in action. Um, it's based on multiple principles of atomic um, uh, resonance of particles uh, when they interact uh, with a magnetic field. So we can explain that a bit later. But uh, basically the idea is to... Uh, use these principles of physics to reveal many different things in the brain. So um, in a clinical setting, uh, what uh, MRI is used for is essentially to reveal very fine details about uh, possible um, um, issues that uh, affect uh, the patient's brain. So like I said before, for CT scan, in terms of um, the anatomical localization of a brain tumor, of a brain lesion, or you know, bleeding in terms of, of stroke, uh, ischemic stroke also uh, with respect to you know, uh, a reduction of the perfusion uh, of the brain tissues uh, with, the, with blood supply. These are very important questions that a medical doctor needs to basically uh, answer to, to properly evaluate a patient in different situations. And the beauty of MRI is really to be able to offer like a catalog of things you can um, basically uh, access to using always the same instrument, that MRI scanner. 
and um, the spatial resolution and the specificity of what you're looking at is way higher than uh, with uh, CT scanning at the expense of both a more uh, uh, costly instrument, uh, but also um, maybe of uh, a duration of the tests that uh, may range from a few minutes to sometimes uh, tens of minutes, depending on uh, how deep you want to, to go in terms of spatial resolution. And in uh, today's uh, basically uh, equipment uh, in MRI units, we are talking about a maximum spatial resolution in a clinical setting of about a few millimeters uh, cube uh, of brain tissues, which when you think about it is, is quite a tour de force, because again, we are not opening the scale of people anymore, uh, for, uh, at, except at rare, with rare, uh, rare exceptions, um, to basically evaluate uh, their, their clinical status. So in that, in that respect, the, the clinical imaging techniques that have developed over the, the past few decades have really revolutionized uh, the way, um, you know, the assessment of brain uh, conditions is being done in, in the hospital. You know, over the, the, the past uh, centuries, so to speak, and again, even until recently, it was not possible at all to assess, you know, what was affecting somebody's mind or somebody's uh, uh, brain and behavior without, uh, you know, proceeding to biopsies or opening the skulls and looking at what was happening in there with all the risks and traumatisms that are uh, going together with this kind of operation. So it's, uh, it's definitely uh, a revolution that has taken place and that is well in March in, uh, in most uh, you know, hospitals. I need to mention a third uh, technique that is also very much used. It's based on nuclear, uh, it's basically a, a, the interface between nuclear medicine and uh, neuroradiology. And it's all the techniques that revolve around um, the uh, emission and, uh, and uh, scattering of radioisotopes that are injected in very small quantities in the bloodstream. And we are talking about two, essentially two techniques. Uh, one is called uh, SPECT, that's the English acronym, and it stands for Single Photon Emission Computer Tomography. And the second one is PET, it's Positron uh, Emission Tomography. So the two, in very lay terms, are very related. Um, with PET being more specific in terms of what brain systems or um, uh, alterations of those systems by, again, a disease or even a mental condition. Um, so it's more specific with PET and you can achieve better accuracy and specificity again uh, in terms of biology and metabolism uh, than with uh, SPECT. And definitely, it's, it's, um, it's like MRI with respect to CT, if you will. SPECT would be the equivalent of CT uh, for anatomy, and uh, PET would be more equivalent to, to MRI. And just like MRI, PET is, is very much a technique that is used um, a lot in research. So in, in that respect, too, too uh, it's definitely a, a technique that has been developing um, in the recent years a lot to target and assess, you know, specific pharmacological, biopharmacological systems in the brain. So, for instance, you can map the uh, intake and production of dopamine um, in, in the brain using, using PET, but, um, which is very important in some uh, disorders, including uh, in psychiatric and mental disorders. Um, you can also look at inflammation which is a process that is very much at play in many different aspects of uh, uh, brain, uh, brain diseases and syndromes. And um, you can also look at uh, very specific uh, aspects of uh, uh, accumulation of mis misfolded proteins uh, in the brain, and which, uh, like in the case of Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative disease, diseases, is, um, is very key to assess, again, uh, the, uh, the condition of a, of a patient. And uh, this has uh, revolutionized uh, the way, uh, you know, uh, we uh, screen patients for uh, not only establish a proper diagnostic that, is, that would be as specific as, uh, as possible, but also to evaluate the efficacy of uh, present and future treatments um, in clinical trials.
So that's also very important. And in that respect, these are important techniques that play key roles to bridge, uh, you know, basic research, uh, including clin clinical research with the, um, the clinical routine. And, uh, and this is very important uh, indeed also for the patients and not only for the doctors. One important aspect indeed when we talk about you know, this translation between research, biomedical research in imaging and the clinical reality, and if we put aside very important aspects of uh, you know, cost to hospitals and to societies, where basically access, for instance, to MRI is, 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 uh, is a great concern in, uh, in many countries um, because of the cost of the equipment and, and of the qualified personnel also. Um, if we go back to the, you know, these, uh, these aspects of research, for instance, what is very um, exciting these days in, uh, in MRI research is uh, looking at brain functions or um, also the way the, the brain is wired. So I've talked a little bit about the, you know, the great diversity of things we can see with MRI. And, and, uh, but in the clinical uh, setting, we, you know, where procedures need to be very efficient, very as, as quick as possible, and also reproducible um, uh, uh, with a great variety of patients, which means also the, the, the test must, must be as short as possible. Uh, so there are constraints in the clinical realm that we don't have in research. But for instance, in, in functional brain imaging with uh, MRI, we are looking at uh, you know, very tiny uh, variations of uh, metabolism that is related to brain function. So it relates to, for instance, the consumption of oxygen by um, uh, the meta metabolisms of uh, neuronal activity. And you know, these things have been, uh, uh, you know, very much publicized and published in research over the past 20 plus years. It's just amazing how this has, uh, you know, produced a, a tremendous uh, progress in uh, on our understanding of uh, uh, brain functions. Yet in the clinical, um, I should say in the clinic, there is no test that is uh, taking advantage of these developments. So we are talking about millions of dollars in research, in fundamental research and, and cognitive neuroscience and even psychology that hasn't translated to the clinic. And one of the reasons is that most of this, um, uh, of, of this research require the testing of you know, relatively large cohorts of patients or um, uh, participants because, the, uh, again, the, the level of signal is very weak with respect to... Um, you know, the, the level of noise in the scanner. And therefore, you need to look at, uh, you know, effects that are revealed usually on a group of people. And it's very hard to detect, you know, uh, uh, signals that are related to brain function in a single individual with a good level of certainty. Um, and that's why in a clinical test, you actually want that level of certainty so that you can derive a conclusion with respect to the condition of that patient you're looking at. And uh, so this is really a bottleneck uh, in the translation from, again, huge research efforts that are, I think, very positive and very um, significant, uh, and that has produced new knowledge and the relatively poor, um, you know, application of the technique in the clinical setting, because again, of lack of uh, sensitivity of the technique at the individual level. You want to pose a diagnostic with certainty on an individual, but yet the sensitivity of the technique is not quite there yet. So uh, there is hope uh, to see that uh, you know, kind of um, resolved in the, in the not so distant future and through two, essentially two, um, two aspects. The first one is always the race to uh, you know, develop and produce scanners that have higher sensitivity. So in that respect, um, for instance, MRI is racing towards using stronger and stronger magnetic fields so that the sensitivity and the level of noise is uh, reduced and so that hopefully we can have better images of brain structure and function in a single individual and um, essentially function because structure is, is for sure already resolved uh, at the individual level. So we'll see how it goes, but this is definitely the next challenge for for, for uh, functional MRI in the clinical setting.
I think the first thing to say is that there's no single area in the brain for music. And, and we know this because we can have a look at patients who have um, suffered musical impairments following stroke, for instance. And what we see is remarkably different um, presentations from depending on where the stroke has damaged the brain. Okay, So you may find a patient who has lost the ability to, um, to perceive timbre in music. So this means like they cannot distinguish between the sound of a flute and the sound of a trumpet, for instance. But in all other aspects, their musical perception might be fine. They can still perceive and, and recognise familiar melodies, uh, etc. But they might have this specific difficulty. Um, on the other hand, you might have people who, um, who, uh, let's see, who've got problems with rhythm but not pitch, or vice versa. So we know we can have a look at how music, how musical perception breaks down in these in these cases of brain damage, mostly following stroke, and we can see that um, that the picture is rather complex and that music is essentially a, a symphony of uh, different components all coming together at once. And these different aspects of musical perception are dealt with by different aspects of the brain. Okay? Um, and that's only even thinking about the perception of music, so the perception of timbre, of pitch, of rhythm, um, of harmony, all of these aspects of musical perception rely on um, rather distinct parts of the brain. Yeah? Um, then we can think about um, <clears throat> the emotional um, uh, effects of listening to music. Um, and we know that um, these areas involved in this emotional experience of music are again different from the areas involved in the perception of music. So, in a very nice study by um, some Canadian researchers, um, Blood and Zatore, um, they asked what was going on in the brains of people who were having uh, musical shivers down the spine. Yeah? So this experience of having a physiological sort of transformation when you hear a specific... It's normally a particular passage in a particular piece, and it's very idiosyncratic. So. Um, my, the piece that causes a shiver down my spine will be different from the piece that um, triggers a similar thing for you. And they, these researchers made use of, of this in a, a very clever way because they looked at the brain's uh, response when people were experiencing their shiver down the spine and they, they know because people could, I think, report after the, the scanning part or perhaps they could press a button to say when they were having this. And they compared um, the act, brain's activation um, in these situations versus when people were listening to um, a piece of music uh, that didn't elicit the shiver down the spine. But the very clever part of the experiment was that one person's trigger was another person's control music. Yeah? So this meant that all of the pieces were present in both the experimental shivers condition and also the control condition. But by sort of looking at um, which participants were experiencing the shiver, they could quite neatly compare um, what is the brain doing in this situation versus when it's not experiencing this shiver. And what they found was that really this experience seems to hijack the brain's general pleasure-related circuitry, so areas like the amygdala and the insula and the thalamus, which are areas that we know to be very responsive to other um, biologically adaptive rewards, um, like um, eating and sexual behaviour as well. So this is really like the um, sex, drugs and rock and roll circuitry of the brain, if you like. Um, and so we know that, uh, so, but even un unpicking the brain's um, response to um, musical pleasure and reward um, is, is quite a complicated story because there's aspects of the brain um, that are involved when we are, we're anticipating something happening in the, 
in the music. And then there's other parts of the brain that are involved when we actually um, uh, are, when the rewarding aspect of the music is delivered, if you like. So there's kind of cycles of activity with different brain areas being involved in the different stages of anticipation and reward. So um, this is an, uh, in fact, one of the um, one of the theories regarding why we like to listen to music um, is to do with um, uh, the rewarding aspects of, of of the musical listening experience. And uh, actually, music offers um, an an opportunity to anticipate um, what what will come next. So. We know that the brain is, if you like, um, a machine. It's a very good um, prediction machine. So essentially, our brains are, uh, must um, make predictions about events that are going to happen in the world, um, because by being able to predict what's going to happen next, we can prepare for it, and that's an important part of, um, you know, evolutionary fitness. Really, being able to you know, prepare and adapt to, to, to things that are going to happen to us. Um, but we can, so, so for instance, why do we derive such pleasure from music? It, is this quite a useless stimulus in a way? It, it, it's not really anything to do with survival. Um, but uh, an interesting theory suggests that actually because of the um, complexity and the structure involved in music, um, there are ample opportunities for our brain's prediction machinery to, to get to work, if you like. So it's a bit like having a, a, a massive cerebral workout when we listen to music, because we, we can always work out where is the music going to go, um, am I surprised by what's happened in the music, so there's many different levels on which we can form anticipations about what's going to happen next. Uh, and of course, we're not doing this for any survival purpose, but the argument goes that because we are by nature prediction, uh, a, a species that, uh, that likes to make predictions, that we can't help but do this. And actually, music is a super stimulus for allowing us to make predictions. And of course, when we're, when we're accurate in our predictions, that can be rewarding. And that's essentially perhaps a part of why we like to listen to music. Well, there's many questions about um, the effects of music on the brain. I suppose, um, so currently I'm quite interested in, in the role of music to modulate mood and how that can be an, in, uh, an effective tool for, um, you know, for mental health conditions or for, for motivating people to do um, rehabilitation after stroke, for instance. Um, so I'm picking the relationship between uh, music, motivation and movement, for instance, is an important area for me. Um, in, in, in my past research, I've also been interested to think about how people who had perceptual difficulties with music, so people who have this thing called congenital amusia, um, can nevertheless in some cases still appreciate music. So that's quite an interesting observation because you might think that in order to be able to appreciate music and have an emotional response to it, you would think that that would only happen if you were able to perceive and encode music um, the way it was intended, uh, um, as the composer wrote it, for instance. And if there, if there are people who um, essentially can't tell one tune from another or seem to have difficulties, at least on the standardised tests that we've been using, seem to reveal quite striking perceptual difficulties with music, it would be logical to think, I'm sure these people are not able to get very much out of music. It probably just sounds like noise to them. But in fact, what we found um, when, we, um, uh, we, when we asked people about their uses of music in everyday life, as well as the psychological reasons um, that, for which they used music, what we found was that there was at least a third of our sample of participants with congenital amusia 
who used music in everyday life just as much as the people without amusia and also um, psychological and also for similar psychological functions as well. So it's telling us that, that within that group of people who do have genuine perceptual difficulties, there are some people who can somehow nevertheless um, get something from, from the music listening experience. And that's an interesting observation, I think, because it shows you that perception and appreciation can dissociate. They're not necessarily always intimately linked.